not making a decision right now. They don't want to do well, when, when we get to the list, if there's any point in doing legal questions that are unanswered in there, before before we call the order, I just a little housekeeping for directors. When you And okay, and Mr. Marol, before we come to order, Mr. Marol, where are you at? I saw him a minute ago. Oh, Amy, is your student here yet? Okay, six thirty is fine. I was if they were here, I was going to just take care of it all at once. But that's fine. All right, all right. I will. Call this meeting of the Sysla School District 97J Board of Directors to order at 6 p.m. And our mission is motivating and preparing all students to reach their greatest potential. Uh, before we get to the first action item, which is the roll call, I just want to, we have a quite a schedule tonight. We have a lot of different things uh, to do and talk about, and there will be three different public comment periods, and I'll mention that a couple more times as we get there. We'll have one public comment period specifically on the Volmers issue, one public comment and anything other than the Volmers or the charter school, and then one public comment section on specifically the charter school application. So just want to let everybody know that, and I'll mention that a few more times. So let's begin with the roll call, please. Riley Olson. Frank Armanderas. Brian Lacatour. Present. Diana Pimlot. Katie Snedden. Present. John Barnett. Present. Maureen Miltenberger. Present. And Chair Snedden. Here. And uh, was Riley, did he indicate if he was going to be here or not? Yeah. Six, okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. And just folks for your edification, Riley Olson is our student representative on the board this year. All right, this is when we would ordinarily go to the executive session. Uh, so we are going to go directly to the matter, which is not specifically delineate, delineated on our agenda, but we are going to go to the complaint against policy from the Volmers about their student. And Mr. Guskoyak, you have something to start us off. Again, I just have the uh, complaint filing here. Um, again, this is with uh, enrollment for the 23-24 uh, school year. Um, again, the opening comments should come from the Volmer family. It's on. You're, am I in? You're in, but I should be on. No, but it's, it's on. In the how about, how, there we go. I had to plug it all the way in. Technical issue. Been there, done that. Okay, so yes, uh, challenge of policy for enrollment into the 23-24 school year. Um, enrollment, uh, enrollment date is September 1st. Uh, that's when uh, enrollment dates are evaluated for uh, the next school year. So again, so oh, in this process, uh, the opening comment should come from the Volmers. 
Mr. Volner, Ms. Volner, and you can both come up and speak at the same time. So, Bob, you're going to like this. I okay. guarantee I'm only going to be one minute, and then Mary Jo's going to take it away. Okay. I just really have a clarification question before she goes, and okay. that is this. As I mentioned last time we spoke in April, I mentioned the message we've been delivered by the school is that our son ages out at 21. And the message we've consistently received from the school during the last three IEPs is that it's out of our hands. There's nothing we can do. It's IDEA and it's the law. So before Mary Jo gets started, I just want to confirm there, is that still the school's stance? Do you guys really believe that you don't have flexibility here or have you have put some thought into it since last time we spoke and changed your mind? Well, that's a fair question. We do, as a policy major, the board does have flexibility in this. Okay, that's all I wanted yeah. to know. Then I don't need to do this. Yeah. You're good to go. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. So I don't want to uh, rehash what we talked about at the board meeting last week. So um, I come before you, and I always want to make this very clear before I speak of anything in regards to Luke or the current situation. We are always very pro-teacher, pro-staff. Everybody's boots on the ground. Everyone's working really, really, really hard. And I always want to make sure that that is acknowledged by us as a family, that we are very appreciative of everybody who is on the boots, boots on the ground with the kiddos. Okay. That being said, um, given that um, I don't want to have to rehash what we talked about last time, there's some information that because of the, the, the depth of what we talked about last time was not able to be shared. Um, so I actually have a statement. It'll be three minutes, so we'll make it really quick, yeah. okay? Okay. We believe there were some inconsistencies following Luke's suspension from school on October 29, 2021 that contributed to bringing us all here tonight. We believe if the special education department had explored all of the resources available in a timely manner, we would not be here discussing educational equity for Luke. Here is a brief timeline. October 29, 2021, Luke is suspended from school. November 18th, 2021, the school psychologist completes her report advising Luke needs a new behavioral support plan to aid in classroom success. December 1st, 2021, Luke returns to limited in-person school on an abbreviated schedule and only on the condition that one specific staff member is in the classroom. Otherwise, Luke is not allowed in the building. What we did not know at the time was that the recommended behavior support plan was not complete when he returned to the classroom. March 29th, 2022, this is the final team meeting to complete Luke's behavior support plan. It took 18 weeks to finalize Luke's behavior support plan. I had presumed that the completed plan was necessary in order for Luke to return to school on December 1st, 2021. In early 2022, I discovered on my own that it was not finished. I have worked for a corporate hospital for several years. If it took me 18 weeks to write a report, surely this would have been a problem with my employer. Furthermore, Luke's support panel was not written by a school psychologist or autism behavioral specialist, professionals who wrote these plans for Luke in the past. In Luke's IEP for that year, it lists Lane County ESD as a provider of the behavior support plan, yet it was done by a Sias Law District employee. When I questioned all of this at Luke's IEP meeting in March, we were told it does not matter how long it took to write the plan, nor who wrote it, but it was important that it was completed and being followed. We disagree. We believe if Luke's behavior support plan was written in a timely manner and by the appropriate specialist, we would not be here right now. Luke is not new to this school. We have been here since 2011. Had the special education department been forthright and said, we do not have the resources to provide Luke with the proper support sports for school. We could have looked at other options, such as busing him to another school district that could meet his needs, work with an in-home tutor or other options. None of these alternatives were offered to us. Instead, Luke sat at home. Sias Law School does have a relationship with Lane County ESD. Why were these resources not further explored? The happy part about all of this is that you as board members have an opportunity to make this right. Luke is aging out at 21 based on a policy that is pre-COVID. We are living in a post-COVID world. Exceptions can be made to policy in response to this historical event. Currently, there are skilled staff in Luke's classroom and COVID relief money is not only available, it is earmarked to close learning gaps. Please vote yes tonight. Give Luke another year at school. 
Thank you. Right. Uh, can I ask you just a couple of quick follow-up questions? You referred to a suspension in uh, what October of 2021. What was the situation that prompted that suspension? He was, sorry, he was having some behaviors. And when you are looking at a child who is nonverbal mm -hmm. and has special needs, oftentimes what happens is that when you have someone who is attuned to that particular student, there will be uh, subtle um, indications in behavior mm -hmm. that will be kind of your precursor before a behavior will escalate and a behavior will escalate and behavior will escalate. So you have to view behavior as communication. And so when behavior gets to a certain point, it, it's kind of like, like um, say that you're in an argument with somebody and, and you're just talking and you're talking and you're talking and you're not being heard. And so it will get escalated to the, to the next level where sometimes someone would choose rather to continue to talk calmly, they would start to yell. And so when you're looking at somebody who is nonverbal, um, there, is, there are these, these, these indications. And so when there's an escalation in behavior, oftentimes it can be seen as being something that is negative when in fact it can be a way for that particular individual to soothe their ner nervous system no matter how scary it might look to an outsider um, it is a way for that particular person to go ahead and, and calm themselves down okay yeah um did this so this escalated the, mm -hmm. this behavior did it ever result in anything physical or anything that would be harmful to anybody else or to luke it could be viewed as that. And, and the thing is, is that I, I would ask for you to go ahead and look because I yeah. wasn't there. I, I couldn't okay. I couldn't tell you what happened. Um, anytime there is a behavior, my understanding is that there is a report. So okay. there should be documentation okay. in, right. in, in the records that say exactly right. what happens. And I just I want to make it clear to everybody that information is privileged and protected under the law. And that's why we'd originally scheduled this for executive session, but the Volmers asked for it. They they were they were uh, fine and okay with bringing it up in, in public session. So, um, and you, I just want to. It was in March of last year, twenty twenty two. Twenty two. That the the option of busing to another site, another school system. You said that was not offered. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. If I can just say this really yeah. quick. Um, I think part of the, the the value of having us being here tonight is oftentimes that when someone hears about autism, it's very easy to say, oh, I saw Rain Man or I saw, you know, my my kids, brothers, you know, neighbors, whatever, is is a savant of some kind. And so for us, I think this is really educational for the community yeah. to really see that when you see something that looks like what something somebody might consider aberrant behavior is just a coping me mechanism for somebody who does not have a neurotypical nervous system. Okay. And so it's not good, bad, or wrong. It's yeah. just what it is. All right. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank All you. Right. If you like. Yes. All right. Uh, at this time, directors, I'd like to invite Ms. Zutz, who is the director of the special programs. And uh, she had, I, I don't, did you send it to all of the directors? Just to me. Okay. Uh, she sent me a, a deal and it's not about Luke's situation, but it's about how the, the special programs department operates. And I think it'd be good to hear from her, and give her a chance to speak to that. So yeah, most so. definitely. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tonight. I appreciate it. Um, is that too loud? It sounds very loud to me. Okay. Um, I will try and keep it in the three minutes as well. Oh, I tried timing myself before. For so. this segment, we don't have a three-minute <laughs> okay. requirement. So what I thought would be helpful is to help all of you understand some of the process around IEP team meetings and around how we come to the decisions, such as abbreviated day, that we do come to, all right? Um, so I'm going to try and stick with my written statement, though, to keep me on track. In special education, programs and process are grounded in policy and law, best practice, and the rights of students experiencing disability. Each student has an IEP developed and reviewed at least annually by a team, including the parent and the student. An IEP is an individualized education plan that is built to support the student's individual needs, and the plan evolves over time to respond to the changes in their development and growth. 
To the point of best practice, it is important for all to understand how decision-making works in the special education process. All decisions are required to be supported by team input at the IEP meetings. Parents and students are always a part of that team process. Teams may also include persons outside the school who are invited by the parent or the student. Additionally, the team includes specialists, teachers, and administrators. Decision-making process for an IEP requires a very deep look into what that student's strengths and needs are, and a team with a variety of voices sitting around the table. Many long IEP meetings have been held over the years to make sure that we have a solid team think time before we make decisions. It does come down to a majority vote based on the information and data discussed. Regarding best practice and decisions about abbreviated day, a shortened day is only implemented in Sayusla School District when a safety concern is raised to ensure a safe learning environment for all students and a safe workspace for our staff. This can be a really difficult balance to strike and we have to take time to make sure that we do that right. Best practice for safety concerns in special education also include a required behavior intervention plan based on a functional behavioral assessment. The IEP team reviews these and deliberates together to make sure that we get it right. The interventions included in the plans are created with input and with editing from the parents. With that in intervention plan, the response also includes what's called a stair step plan in to add additional time. The staff will track the data on behavior and as it shows that the student can be safe for longer periods of time, more time is added. To be clear, when a student is escalated, it not only impacts their behavior, but it impacts their learning as well. They aren't learning at that time and the others around them aren't either. To the point of rights of a student experiencing disability, it is our department's view that all students have value and can grow and learn within all school communities. Aging out is one example of honoring a person's dignity, the dignity of the individual to be seen as an adult and to transition to programs for adult services communities. This is not about developmental age, it is about linear age and the equitable view that we hold of their dignity and rights. That was my written statement uh, and I would uh, answer me, any questions. I'd just like to ask you a clarified question. You, re, you said when a student is escalated, can you explain to me, I'm not in that field, so I'm not sure what that means. Yes, well, um, and I, I echo Mary Jo's statement in terms of that behavior is communication, 100%. And escalation is a, a, a sensory- uh, Oh, so this it, is in, re in relation to behavior. It is, okay. yes, right. yes. And, and dysregulation and escalation are two terms that frequently get used with behaviors. You know, you can say, oh, a kid had a behavior. Was it a good behavior, a bad behavior? I mean, it's all, you know, but it is communication. That is actually no. right. Yeah. Um, Escalation can take a lot of different forms. It can take the form of yelling. It can take the form of pounding on things. It can take the form of really higher escalation of throwing things and or putting hands on others. And okay. so at a certain point in the deliberations of the IEP team, if that escalation creates a situation where maybe it is a, a, a higher safety level, that's when we start looking at okay. the video today. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Guskoyak. Well, again, uh, this would be a time for the board to set a time to evaluate policy and look at options. Um, again, by policy, the board has uh, 20 days to respond to this uh, uh, challenge of policy. And again, having met with the Volmers before, I know that County Disability Services is looking for a self-contained inclusive environment for Luke. And Again, there's just not a lot of services available, whether he would be, again, a, a, an age in or an age out student. And so, again, that's another part of the equation, whether it's SISLA paying for the service or a partnership or a collaboration with county services and contracting with them, or they contracting back with the district to provide uh, you know, a spot on our campus. Those are things that should be brought together. 
Um, but again, in terms of the exception to policy, that's something the board needs to decide together. Yeah. Uh, I guess Should this I... time, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, you go and then. Oh, well, I, at this time, we have a lot of people who came anticipating you speak uh, on uh, the Volmer's behalf. So let's give them the opportunity to do that right now. And I would, we have, where's my red folder? You have it. <laughs> we have a few people who have emailed or put their names on the list and I'm, there we go. And I just want to let everybody know, we have received all of the electronic communications emails and copies have been sent to all of the directors. So, um, but you're still welcome to make a comment on their behalf if you like, but if you've already, if you're gonna say what you've already said, you're welcome to, to say that, let's stay with that. But right now we have one, do, have we had any others sign up, you know? Okay. Well, yeah, but you've already spoke. Oh, okay, uh, are you here to speak only on this this policy issue though? Oh, okay. Well, you'll have that opportunity later. And Mary Jo, you signed up also. Is okay. But uh, the only public comment is Janet Wellington has has signed up to speak. Ms. Wellington. And uh, if you would just keep your comments brief, we have a lot of things to. You know, I, I turned like it. It's under three minutes. Oh, that's all right. All right. Um, I'm not a parent, but when I heard about the situation with Luke Volmer, it touched me deeply. Luke is in the bridge program at Sayus Law School District, and his parents were told by the director of special programs that he will age out when he turns 21 this summer, and that he will no longer qualify for educational services by the district. It's clear to me what a positive effect his special programs education has had on his life skills. He's also lucky to have devoted parents, but he obviously um, absolutely deserves every minute of education due him. It seems a simple thing, make up for the lost hours or days of instruction during COVID, plus hours or days lost due to staff shortages during, before or after COVID by extending his education at least one year, rather than automatically aging him out the minute he turns 21. Actually, to me, every hour should be made up and I would suggest someone might figure it out exactly. It's only fair that he receive every minute he is due. I think extending his education to make up for lost time is a reasonable request and it should be honored. There are reasons for aging out of the system, I suppose. Though I would argue that Luke's situation is an example of reasons to have some flexibility built in too. I can't help but wonder why age 21 is a magic number. And I've learned that the aging out number differs from state to state, some being as late as age 26. It also is evident that school systems are allowed some flexibility. Thank you, especially if there is funding to support this. I understand funding is not an issue in Luke's situation. I'm also concerned about tracking the COVID relief money mentioned in the testimony at the school board meeting of April 12. If there have been discrepancies between special needs students and their general education peers, I expect it to be clearly researched and presented. Transparency should be there. And my expectation is that this information is offered to the public. Lastly, late in the day today, in researching the regulations, I communicated with senior program specialist Molly Williamson at FACT Oregon. FACT Oregon is a 501c3 nonprofit in good standing with the state of Oregon. They are the designated statewide parent information and training center in Oregon. In her email to me, she explained, if a student turns 21 in July, after this school year ends, they will be eligible for services next school year. They will not be 21 when this school year ends. They can receive services through and including age 21. This means Luke is indeed eligible to continue his education. I'm not sure why his parents are being told he's done on his birthday, which occurs after the end of the school year. So I appeal to the decision makers to extend Luke's education at least one year and follow the Oregon regulations that clearly state he is eligible while he is 21. All right. Would you, you like any would supporting? Would you please give it to Ms. McClellan there and that way she will uh, get it to all the directors. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams. Yes, sir. About this, this topic only? Uh, yes, please. And we have... 
Michael Allen has has requested to speak. And if you would just state your name and address for the record, Mike. Yes, uh, Michael Allen, 87490 Rota Wood Drive, okay. Florence. I was here the last time that this particular issue was brought before. And you remember I followed them and was very emotional about what they were asking for. I did want to remind you that I have a daughter that had an intellectual disability and went through the special ed program. We're talking, she's 60 now. So we're talking about way back when. But when she aged out, she did go through through 21. And the only opportunity that she had was a goodwill workshop. So the point I'm making here is that if the better option for this child is to stay in school for another year, I would recommend that you do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Appreciate it. All right. Last call for anybody else to speak on the Volmer matter only. We'll have public comments for the charter school application and for anything else in general in just a little bit. All right. Hearing none. Uh, and I'm seeing it's 624. And we are scheduled for a 6.30 start. So directors, any questions about the Walmart thing or any suggestions? Director Sneddon, you said you, you looked like you had something you wanted to say. Okay. My yeah, side, oh, go ahead. yeah I'm, I'm entirely sympathetic to the Walmart's issue here. Um, grew up as a handicapped child with a learning disability myself. So I understand a lot of what they're dealing with. And um, when Luke was uh, expelled uh, superintendent in uh, March of uh, 2022, um, there seems to be- I believe it was October 21. October 21. And that was the behavioral issue. Yeah. yeah. Was, was Mrs. Vollmer or the Vollmers given a report as to exactly precisely what the expulsion was about? He, he was not expelled. Okay. But no, there was a report on what happened in the classroom at the time. Yes. So how, well, I, I don't understand why he wasn't in school then if he wasn't expelled. He, he was, he Mrs. Lutz would have to speak on that to the details yeah, and, of the report. And here's what I was going to suggest anyway, rather than to have her betray confidence right. issues and privacy issues. Uh, I would suggest. I, don't, I, we, I guess I don't want to. Just, I don't want to know the specific issues. Yeah. I just want to know if if the Vollmers were given were were given well, those issues specifically. She's so not in her yet. Have she's not in her head. Yes. Okay. And okay. What I'm what I'd like to suggest is we got a lot of stuff here, and we had a lot of things on our plate tonight. Uh, and I think you to do the proper service to Luke and to the Vollmers and to the district. I think we need to have a, a meeting, a special meeting to specifically deal with this issue. Yeah. And we have to give them, we have 20 days in which to give them a response to right. this from, well, from I, here. I, yeah, I'm concerned about hanging them out there any longer, though. Well, I think we need to do this as quickly weeks. as we possibly can. Uh, yes. I think the turnaround uh, for staff to get ready for it, for all us to get ready for it next week is a really busy week for right. a lot of people. 24th uh, would give us an opportunity to to meet and do that. And I have a couple other suggestions later this evening, but. Uh, would that be a public meeting? It would be a public meeting, okay. but it would not be, uh, it would be, I would, I would couch it in a public, in a, in a publicly held work session for us to discuss and get some questions answered and deal with things. And then uh, we, we would yeah. have an agenda just like we would any other night in, uh, I would think we would come to a decision. Yeah, I, just, I, I would we, like us to move yeah, as quickly yeah. as we could. Could we then, um, just like we did with the budget meeting, where we sent questions ahead of time that staff needed to research? I think that's research, a great idea. But then they, those, you know, those were made public record and they were shared with yeah. everybody. Could we do that? I, yeah. I think that's appropriate. If, if I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, send them directly to Mr. Koskoyak. So looking at your district calendar, I would suggest a non-Wednesday, if okay. you can agree to that, um, simply because we're, we've got scholarship night on the 24th. That's right. And so coming back. Um, How's you, the 22nd? 22nd is evening of excellence. That's, yeah. Um, and so, so conceivably, you could do Tuesday the 23rd. I don't see anything on the district calendar. For that date, um, you could do uh, Thursday the 18th 
Um, but that might, I don't have the full rhododendron event no. schedule. Thursday that's going to be rough. Is out for me. Yeah, that's going to be out for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and again, we could conceivably turn this around if I got board questions by the end of the week. We, we could do this Wednesday the 17th. I don't know what's on the rhododendron pageant schedule for the 17th. And I know a lot of people go to their pre-service shows. So, I mean, that's. I don't well, think there's much on the coronation. Coronation is this Saturday, so that won't be any, anything next week. Uh, so I guess it boils down to either Tuesday the 24th. 23rd. 23rd. Or Wednesday the 17th. So uh, any any preferences? I'm open for either one. Yeah, yeah. Frank wants to Frank? expedite this. I'm okay with the 17th. Okay. 17th for me. 17th is better for me, too. Yeah, 17th works for me, too, but but I guess... I'm curious is is with all of this information that we that we were emailed and and hopefully all read through um is there is there more information pending uh, what I'm looking at uh director Lacatour is that I made myself a couple notes and I have some specific questions that I don't feel are appropriate because they involve the privacy of of, of the student and stuff and I, and and some of them may need to have some notes. I mean, there was a talk of the incident that happened in October of 2021, and there's a report on that. I think I think it would be appropriate for us to see that too. Sure. Then I then I I side with Frank that yeah, let's make this happen soon. Like, soon, soon. I just wanted to ask one clarifying question. Um, he did return. Luke did return to school after that incident, correct? Yes. Yes, I believe so, he did. Yes, he did. Yeah. So then that inc incident basically was resolved at that point. Yes, and then again, as behavior improved, time was added on to his day. Okay. And it increased, yes. So I'm not too sure that we really need to debate that incident or to talk well, about and it. Well, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't want to debate it. No, uh, I, debate yeah. is the wrong word, but really discuss it in need. I but mean, the, if, we re if we return to school. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I tell you what, we could, here's what I would suggest then. I'm in favor of doing it next week. If somebody wants to make a motion one way or the other, we'll deal with it then. And if somebody wanted to make a motion to resolve it, that would be appropriate. Or if somebody wanted to make a motion to have a special meeting to deal with it next week, that would be appropriate as well. Your pleasure, directors. Mr. Chair, I would make a motion that we uh, set a special meeting for the 17th. I would second that motion. Okay, motion's been made and seconded to set a, yes. a special meeting next Wednesday night at the district office. I would imagine we'd work on all that. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay. Turn your mic on and say that again. Yeah. I would prefer that we just go ahead and vote on it tonight. Okay, but we do have the motion on the floor to discuss it next Wednesday. So, Director Ramadar, oh, okay, I saw you, my. Any other discussion on the motion to have it a meeting next week to discuss it and come to a decision, I would imagine. Hearing none, I would ask for a roll call vote, please. And directors, as your name is called, please turn your microphone on. And... Frank Armaderas. Yes. Brian Lacatur. No, I prefer to vote tonight. Diana Pimlot? No. Katie Snedden? Aye. John Barnett? Aye. Maureen Miltenberger? Aye. And Bob Snedden? Aye. Motion carries 5 2. And your notes are duly noted, so. All right, uh, with that in mind, it is now 6.32, which means we are going to our regular portion of the meeting. So I will officially call this portion of the meeting to oh, real quick, uh, yes. before you officially yes. close it. So so that motion was we have a meeting next Wednesday. To discuss this, yes. at On the 17th at? at yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and once again, we'll move into the public or the regular session, and our mission is motivating and preparing all students to reach their greatest potential. 
Thank you all for coming tonight. It's a little bit more of an audience that we're used to, but we appreciate having you all here. Um, we'll begin with Alaria Mendolia and uh, Ms. Tregoni. All right. Um, yes, Raymond, uh, this Pledge of Allegiance. That's what we're doing. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> so it is, whoo, she's right, it is loud. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Alary Mendolia. Uh, Mendolia. Uh, she is one of our seventh grade students. She's a wonderful seventh grade student. Um, and our whole team is super proud of her. Um, she has blossomed so much this year. She has been a very quiet wallflower of a student. And all of a sudden she has started asking amazing questions and her art has just been exploding in all of our classrooms. Um, she's such a great critical thinker, asked so many great questions. She's a kind kid um, and she's really just an all around student. She started playing, uh, started doing athletics this year. She's in the Clay Target League. She started playing basketball. Like, this is what we're talking about with Sayus Law. So we were uh, very happy to nominate her as our uh, uh, representative for, uh, not student of the month, uh, the flag salute. All right. And folks, the flag is on the wall in the upper corner of the gymnasium in Valeria. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And because every parent wants a good photo opportunity, Hilaria, would you come on up and, and your parents could come up too. All right, uh, 2.3, 2.4, is Jacob here this evening? Oh, there he is. Jacob Blankenship is the student liaison to the board from the high school. Good evening, my name is Jacob Blankenship. I'm here to give the monthly and my final uh, Saisla High School uh, ASB report. Um, as far as school events go, we just had our uh, prom last weekend on Saturday. It was a really fun event. A lot of people had a lot of fun, um, really good feedback. Our juniors did a really good job with all the decorations. The theme was Arabian Nights. It was really looked like Aladdin in the event center. So um, it was it was a really fun night. And that money that is raised by the juniors will help fund their graduation next year. Speaking of graduation, graduation is in less than a month or just a month from yesterday. Um, it's rapidly approaching. Our seniors only have eight or 16 days left of school. So it's coming to a close very fast. Um, right now, seniors in leadership are just getting logistics with graduation, trying to order decorations, backdrops, things like that. Um, and usually this time of year in leadership, there are a bunch of elections for next year. So student offices that are being uh, ran for, there's a bunch of races. However, this year there's only one race and that's for my position, ASP president, and the rest are kind of set in stone and don't really <laughs> want to change. Um, so that will be held next Monday. The speeches will be held next Monday in our gym during Pride. As far as sports go, yesterday our boys golf team won their district championship. Uh, 
by over 40 points. Say that, say that last part one more time. They won by 41 points, I believe. 41 strokes. Sorry, yeah. strokes. Sorry. Yeah. I, I, I keep making <laughs> That's not just one that's dominated. Points. Yeah. Yeah. But they came, they came in, uh, you know, they had seven consecutive tournament wins, which is pretty exciting for our second year of our golf team being a thing or at least in a row. Our track and field team will have their district meet here at Hans Peterson Field next Thursday and Friday. It'll be another all day thing. And actually, I know two both uh, golfers and track and field athletes, they do both at the same time. Next week, they're only getting one day of school because they have the state tournament and then the district tournament or district meet for track. So it's kind of crazy, kind of uh, a busy time of year. Our softball team is wrapping up their softball season. They have two more games left. Both of them are here on Friday. Uh, the weather's supposed to be very nice. So if you're not doing anything, uh, come watch our baseball and softball teams. Our, so our baseball team will have a shot at the playoffs this year. They play Pleasant Hill Friday as well. They have a doubleheader at 2 and 4.30, I believe. So um, another chance to watch our Cecil athletes. So like I said earlier, this is my final time speaking at a school board meeting this year. I've really appreciated the opportunity to come and uh, give you a few updates on our school. And it's easy for me to come here and talk about all the good things that are happening, all the sports that are winning, um, the events happening at the school uh, or the clubs that are you know, going on. But this doesn't give you an accurate representation of what's actually happening in our schools. It doesn't show you how students interact with each other, how they interact with teachers, how they, um, how the school culture is, how the environment is, and really these ob observations can only be made by you. At the school board, as a school board, you're in a position to make a bunch of, you know, decisions that can have a good, a pretty good effect on our students. And I believe with the power you hold, you should be making these observations at our schools pretty frequently, but not just on a, as, at a Veterans Day assembly, not at a job fair, but how they are actually functioning on a daily basis. And this perspective is not a unique perspective. I know very, I know a bunch of students, a lot of staff and a lot of teachers who feel the same way. They feel like our school board isn't necessarily as involved or in our schools as they should. So my request to you is just to be in our schools more, see how it's going on a daily basis, how they're actually functioning. This way you can use the power that you hold to better assist our teachers, our students, et cetera, and you know, the voting and like that. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity to speak. Jacob, I'd like to thank you for your input all year long that you've brought to us. It's been it's been good to hear that that you bring to us. Thank you very much. All right, item two point five, approval of the agenda for this evening's rest of this meeting's this evening's meeting. Mr. Gaskoyak. Okay, uh, present for the board agenda item uh, zero five one zero two three two point five. Approval of the agenda, superintendent, board chair, vice chair meet to prepare the board agenda one week prior to the meeting. Items of business may be suggested by any board member, staff member, student or citizen of the district by notifying the superintendent at least five working days prior to the meeting. Any changes to the agenda must be approved by majority vote. Administration recommends approval of the agenda. All right, directors, your pleasure. Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Be it resolved that the Sayusla School Board of Directors approve the agenda as presented, Resolution 051023-2.5, approve agenda. Is there a second? No, second. Motion made by Vice Chair Miltenberger, seconded by Director Armendariz to approve the agenda as submitted. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Motion carries unanimous. All right. Thank you very much. Now we go to public comment. And this time, uh, I know there's a lot of people who are here to speak about the charter school. 
application and uh, we're going to call for that separately. Right now, I'd just like to ask for people who would like to speak to anything other than the Volmer matter that we talked about already or the charter school application. And the Volmers were the first ones to request. You have a letter to read to us, Mr. Volmer? So all I'm going to do right now is read some excerpts from this letter from Kate Brown. It's not to me. This is a letter I pulled up from public sources. Okay. Andy's probably seen it. I don't know. I think it might have gone out to all the public schools. All right. ODE recognizes the extraordinary disruption that COVID-19, that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused our communities. ODE has been aware that as a result of staff shortages, some programs that exclusively serve students experiencing disability and have changes to the length of the school week. This policy letter serves as a reminder of the obligation for the local education agencies or agencies to ensure a free and appropriate public education is made available to each eligible child. School districts and programs must ultimately ensure that they deliver the educational services in a way that complies with those laws. ODE has consistently named that children experiencing disabilities have been and continue to be disproportionately impacted by the pandemic compared to their peers who do not experience disabilities. The department also recognizes that workforce shortages require complex multifaceted solutions that necessitate coordination and collaboration across sectors. And as such, it's not an easy problem to solve. Regardless of the challenges associated with the pandemic, including workforce shortages, school district programs must continue to meet all federal and state requirements, including ensuring that discrimination does not occur and that FAPE is provided for each eligible student. This communication reinforces the department's priority to ensure districts and programs meet obligations under the IDEA so that eligible children experiencing disabilities receive a free and appropriate public education. ODE expects districts to districts programs to comply with IED requirements. It is equally important that the district programs properly address and equitably treat all eligible students experiencing disabilities while keeping in mind each student's unique pandemic. Now, I'm going to disagree with one thing she said here, and she said this is a complicated issue. In our case that was presented to you, I don't understand why this is a complicated issue. It should be easy. And I'm going to, I know you guys scheduled an appointment for one day after the election next week. I'm going to ask, I know two people on this board recommended you vote on it tonight. I'm going to ask that you vote Mr. tonight. Mr. Volmer, I would point out to you, everyone had an opportunity to make a motion. Okay. Nobody made a motion to take action tonight. A motion was made to put it up till next week, and that is the motion that carried and when you said you wanted to speak to us at this time, you had an opportunity earlier to speak. If you want to speak to your son's issue again, I gave you plenty of opportunity to do that in the first half hour of this meeting. Well, you're right, you did. And I actually thought you'd vote on it tonight, but you guys made the decision not to. So I didn't know I was going to say that until just now. All right. Well, All right. Duly noted. Uh, can you give me the date of Kate Brown's letter? November 30th, 2021. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Mayor Joe, did you want to? Hi, my name is Mary Jill Volmer. I'm the mother of four. I live here in Florence. Three of my children attend the school district here. As you know, our son is Luke Volmer and he attends the bridge program in um, Mrs. Johnson's classroom. Our ask is this, give Luke one more year at school. Let's talk about Luke for a moment. When Luke was born, he suffered a traumatic labor and delivery, was not breathing, resulting in immediate resuscitation. He was transported to OHSU's Dorn Becker's neonatal ICU, where the doctors told us he would not live. After two weeks in the NICU and still very much alive, Luke went home with a feeding tube. We were told he would never eat on his own. Well, that kid pulled that tube out and within a week started eating. When he was not walking by 18 months, the doctors told us he would never walk. We enrolled Luke in an intensive therapy program where he learned to walk within one month. And the headmistress had to pull us aside and ask us to leave since Luke had met all of his goals for sustaining for the rest of the year. I could go on and on about how Luke was told no in the past and how he has overcome so many obstacles to get to where he is today. Luke is truly a miracle proving time and again with the right supports, he will thrive and exceed expectations. COVID-19 was a historical event that impacted everyone. 
we acknowledge this. However, while most of the world moved on, Luke has stayed home due to staffing shortages created by the pandemic. We learned that only two students out of the 1,400 plus students at Cyrus Lock currently are not back to full-time in-person lear learning. Luke is one of them. We are told that Luke will age out when he turns 21 based on policies that were created pre-COVID. We are living in a post-COVID world, as I had said earlier. Luke lost valuable learning time because of the pandemic. Now, right now, not only is Luke's classroom nearly back to pre-COVID staffing levels, there is COVID relief money available specifically earmarked to close the learning gaps created because of the pandemic. And most important, Luke is learning valuable life and job skills when he is physically allowed in school. Want a sandwich? Luke will try to make one, something he was not doing just a few months ago. He is talking more these days, even singing songs he makes up. He's never done that before. Luke is learning to make deliveries. In fact, he hand delivered his own complaint form so the board could meet about his case tonight. Can you imagine what he will learn with another year at school? As a mother, I'm looking at every board member Whew. and asking you personally, are you going to be the one who tells Luke that he can no longer come to school? Will you vote no for educational equity for Luke when so many other districts in Oregon and across the nation are saying yes? to the special needs population that is arguably suffering the most during the pandemic. Please, I say yes, give Luke another year at school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vaughn. Oh, we have one more. Yes. All right, and there's a lot of things that we have to discuss as a board and we have, we have a few more questions to ask of staff. And thank you for that last, that last comment that was that was good uh right now we have michael allen to speak on anything other than the volmer issue or the charter school and i would invite anybody else who would like to speak on anything other than the two issues that i've just mentioned you can go to the table over the side and fill out a form and bring it to mrs mcclellan here in the floral dress before i start i do have a speaker's card for the public hearing later as well Oh, okay. It, oh, yeah, I have. Great, thank I you. Have that here. Otherwise, I would modify my speech here. <laughs> well, well, good evening, school board members, student representative, superintendent and staff. I'm Michael Allen, a resident within the Sias Law School District. Recently, I had the good fortune to hear a remarkable presentation by Maya Stout in Yahats. Maya is an 18-year-old student at Newport High School and a climate activist. She gave an impassioned plea for adults in their life to create ways to involve students without telling the students what their involvement should be. Here are some quotes from Maya's presentation. My entire future revolves around human rights and climate activism. Like many other young adults, to ensure a safe future, I'd been forced to drop all extracurriculars and limit my time with friends so I could handle the extra workload my activism has created. I made the decision because I am aware that by the time I'm 25, my climate fate will be sealed and there will be nothing we can do to reverse the effects already started. Throughout this past decade, young people have begun making a huge stand for climate change and climate action by advocating their future and the generation to come. The generations of young activists have brought new hope to the crisis. It is crucial to involve students in the conversation about their planet. And I'm sure you know they have the strongest voice to advocate for it. We have an army of young voices that would love to speak but simply need access to a platform. We need to create systems for young people to use their voice, but also don't undermine their freedom to decide what to say. She ended by saying, if you want youth involved, it starts with you. 
Now I applaud the school board for adding a student representative, Riley, to the board and a student liaison to give monthly reports, Jacob. Maya, who began her climate activism in third grade, says we need to do more to give our youth a voice. My recommendation is to create a youth climate advisory committee, one that has the freedom to advise you about forming a climate action plan. They will need more climate education, K through 12, to become good advisors. A great start would be the formation of environmental and climate justice clubs. I believe there are many students in the Sias Law schools that can follow the lead of Maya Stout. A postscript. In my written testimony, you will find a link to an article in the Oregonian about climate-related anxiety among young people that is on the rise in Oregon. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. All right, uh, Ms. Wheeler, um, we've already given ample opportunity for other people to talk to the Volmer issue. Uh, so, but I, would you please, if you could give us a brief comment, please do that, Pam Wheeler. All right. My name is Pam Wheeler, a lot of you know me. My husband and I moved here in 1992. I brought with me a child with problems. He came out of special education in California, 10 teachers to 10 students. I sat him down in this high school next to a very nice special ed teacher who stayed with him, Claire, through school for four years. I never had to pick him up and bring him home. I was never called. They took care of it. My son today at 45 has opened restaurants all over the world. He is a success story. When children with special needs are taken out of an environment, it is a losing environment, not just for them, but for the other students. My son has lifelong friends he has brought from this high school. I'm sorry, I'm emotional. I don't often think about this journey, but I am here to vouch for the Walmarts. Their son needs to be in the school and the students here need to be support to him. It's so essential for people to learn how to care for people with disabilities. Thank you. Right, thank you, Ms. Reagan. Okay, so... Directors, what do you feel about taking charter school comment before we hear the application from the sponsors? Your preference? Rather hear the application. Hear the application. Yeah, me as well. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm I'm seeing nods all the way around. All right, so we'll move to four point one, which is the charter school application and a public hearing for Sice Valley Charter School. So. Uh, just want to call them down there. You have a comment. All right. Uh, so, do we have the sponsors here? Oh, Eric, yeah, please step to the microphone and uh, let's see your presentation. It's just one. Oh, there's more time than that, Eric. Oh, okay. Uh, looks like the one short for the superintendent. But it also looks like it's on the screen. Yeah. Is this the one that is this what we're getting tonight? This is essentially what was given. Okay. All right. If you would please kindly introduce yourself. Uh, Christopher, the microphone's not on. It is now. Hello. Oh, perfect. Okay. I can remember a time when you put a microphone in front of you, you would not speak. Oh, boy, I'm I am still almost there. But thank you for helping me overcome. 
Um, my name is Eric Snedden. I'm the uh, one of the founders of Whitmore Classical Academy. I'm uh, very thankful that you are taking the time to hear from us tonight. I also would like to uh, give a great, a big thank you to Mr. G and his staff. Uh, we met with Mr. G uh, about a year ago just to inform him um, of our intentions of going down this process. And Mr. G was very helpful in providing us uh, materials that the state uh, from the state and his staff has been very um, helpful with questions. I know that in many situations across the state, when a charter school option is presented, um, many uh, school districts choose to have a more combative role, and that has not been the situation. So uh, Mr. G's professionalism um, and the staff should be commended. So thank you very much. So I would also like to introduce our founding board. Um, what, where are we at? Heather Hammond is our vice chair. She's a medical professional and as long as well as a parent. Uh, Kathy Ward, sitting back here, um, is a director. She's a retired uh, school district administrator, educator as well. Uh, Donna Heinen, our secretary, uh, along back here. She's newer to the area, but very passionate about classical education. She's seen the benefits um, of it with her own grandchildren. Crystal Osborne is a director, parent um, as well, and Chase Olson, parent and a business, local business owner. So why a classical education? The main point of a classical education charter school for Florence is to provide local families an educational choice. Uh, we'll actually go over these more independently, but uh, provide an option for families who left the district um, or actually public education during the pandemic, an option to return to a uh, public option. Prevent families from leaving um, the district in search of more educational opportunities and attract outside professionals um, and their families to the area. So when we say uh, to provide local families educational choice, we have choice in almost everything that we do in our lives. But when it comes to education, more rural communities lack that choice. You don't have to go far to find options in Eugene. They have immersion schools, they have private schools, they have parochial schools, they have um, charter schools, and they have a public option. Being rural, of course, that is a little bit more difficult. We also know that um, providing a choice helps actually benefit school districts where there are charter schools. They're actually able to retain more students in the area. Provide an option for families who left public education is key. Uh, post pandemic, uh, we are seeing families uh, choose other educational opportunities. If you live in a metro area, of course, those opportunities are um, vast and, and great. In rural Oregon and, and rural parts of the country, of course, um, those are actually more to just uh, homeschooling or on other online options. The state of Oregon, as many of you know, has seen the second most loss of students uh, in public schools. Only Mississippi um, has had more uh, students leave public education. We know that a majority of these parents are not turned off by public education, they're just frustrated. Uh, they're frustrated with what um, they saw during uh, the pandemic, and they've frustrated with uh, coming out of those. And so they're looking for other options. Most of these parents are um, willing to come back to a public option and a classical education. Of course, when you come back in, even through a charter school, it also brings dollars back to the district that they have lost. Of course, we want to prevent families from leaving. We know that every major employer in the community loses uh, employees every year because of educational, uh, lack of educational options. Um, one of our largest employers, of course, the medical center, the, that is their number one site. It's difficult for to get them to come because of housing and because of school options. But once they're here, they love the area. We just seem to see that when students are transferring from that fifth grade, that elementary school to the middle school, that's where they tend to leave. Anybody who's sitting here, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, folks here who probably have been through many uh, primary care physicians in the time that they've lived here, the number one reason for their exodus is educational option. We get them here, we want to keep them here. We also wanna attract, uh, be a beacon for professionals and, and, uh, and skilled 
uh, people in skilled positions. When families come into the area and you have a public charter school, they are given an option. They don't always choose the, the charter school. The fact that the option is here is what's key for those people to look at Florence to move to, whether they're moving here to start a business, whether they're here, moving here to grow a business, whether they're here to fill a position, whether they're coming as a doctor or a physician or rehab specialist, when they have that option, they are able to look more closely to the area. Of course, with our medical center being having facilities all across Oregon, Washington, and Alaska, it's easy for the medical center to attract people. What is difficult is to get those physicians and those medical professionals to choose Florence instead of um, Vancouver or Portland. Of course, when they come here, the district wins no matter what. Because if they weren't here to begin with, when they come, a portion of the funds that come through the state, of course, stay with the home district. So the district then uh, is a net positive regardless of um, whether they're when they're new, the whether they choose public or charter. The big thing also for the school district to remember when considering the charter is the ability to recoup lost funding for homeschool families. There are families who don't do public education um, from from day one. They have not put their kids in public education. And those those reasons are vast, but a majority of those re, majority of those homeschoolers choose classical curriculums for their students. There are a number of families who've lived in the area for a long time, families who moved to the area a long time who don't even look at the school district. They know they're going to homeschool because of the curriculum that they want to utilize. When you offer a classical education, you will then increase. We actually see a large number of those families um, will actually choose the classical education option, which of course brings dollars back into the district that they would never have seen otherwise. The other thing that you see is in the state of Oregon, as you know, if a homeschool family chooses to do extracurriculars, it's at the cost of the district. There aren't funds that come in for those. So when you can get a family to choose a public charter op um, option over the homeschooling and then take advantage of the curriculum, the dollars that stay with the district because the, that student enters into the charter school, then helps offset any cost the districts may um, have when those families choose extracurricular activities. So what is classical education? With classical education, most people wanna tell you what classical ed education is not. That's not fair. It's also quite lazy. Classical education, and I wanna make sure that I hit all the key points here. Classical education is, this, uh, is, the, is a well-rounded course of study. And I know that that can be kind of a cliche, but when we say a well-rounded course of study, all students learn literature in full texts. They are not abridged, they are the full text. I know I think back to my time at school um, in literature and, and English, we would read page 42 through 45 of Othello, and then we would jump to the end, but we never actually got into the full text. In the classical education, oh, I don't know what I did there, sorry. In the classical education, you read the full text and you dive into the full text. In history, um, they, get in, they get deeper into history. Of course, there's always the, the term an inch deep and a mile wide. In classical education, you dive fully into uh, what you are studying and you will learn to um, think deeper about the things that you're, that you're learning about. It focuses on the sciences and the sciences are introduced very young. Um, what a classical education curriculum is doing in sixth grade science is equal generally in, uh, on a national level to a ninth grade level science. Uh, the fine arts, they are not disposable in classical education. Fine arts is an absolute key part of a classical education. It is important to understand that Julius Caesar was a historical figure. He was real. However, so many people only know him as a Shakespeare play. So by being able to dive into the arts, you are learning about the person, historical figure, but then you are also seeing them represented in the arts. You're interested in Greek and Latin. Why Greek and Latin? It's a dead language. Greek and Latin is key to helping to develop uh, language skills, reading, uh, writing, expression. It is, the English language is a mixture of 
the romantic languages in German, of course, Latin and Greek is the basis of all your romantic languages. When you learn Greek and Latin, it makes you a better speller. It makes you able to identify um, the root word and its origin and all of those things. All of those things help you with critical thinking skills and help you develop your, um, your skills in understanding. Classical education is one cohesive curriculum, which means that the, you are taught consistently through one curriculum from start to finish. In modern education, what typically happens is the math department is told, we need a curriculum. Go find something that you guys like, something that you want to teach. The literature department is given, is given the same instruction. The science department is given the same instruction. Not always do, does the math department pick from the same company who made the arts. There's not a lot of cohesive running there. In classical education, when it comes to mathematics and science, you are learning the equations and the formulas in depth prior to getting into chemistry class. Your chemistry teachers are not having to have a math lesson so that the kids can, can be successful um, in the class. They are learning it and then they are seeing it applied in real life. I know it was 24 years ago that I was sitting here in a student and thinking to myself, when am I ever going to use this? Like in public speaking, which is odd. But <laughs> I, but this curricular, classic curriculum shows the students consistently where you're going to use these in everyday life. So classical education is broken down in three major categories, your grammar, your logic, your rhetoric. What does that mean? Your grammar is produced at an elementary level, K through five. It's your foundations. It's your basic arithmetic. Um, it's your basic uh, uh, reading, reading skills. Your logic is the formation of a deeper understanding. That comes along in middle school. Everybody here has had a middle schooler. Everybody who currently has a middle schooler, uh, I'm definitely there. Um, knows that a middle schooler loves to tell you what they know. <laughs> with, with the logic section, it's, for me, it's the formation of a deeper understanding. So what you're asking them is to not read it for what they think it is, but to dive into why they believe what they believe. And then um, you get into your rhetoric stage. It is not the political term of rhetoric. It is actually being able to uh, have the, define the ability, or sorry, develop the ability to express and defend your knowledge. So if you're speaking with somebody on something that you believe that you have learned and somebody else has been able to tell you that through their own debate that, they, that, that that is not the case, you're able then to look at that and say, I do need to go back. I do need to look and see why I have the belief that I do, and do I need to continue to learn to defend it, or do I need to look at maybe changing my opinion? So the liberal arts and sciences, um, the, we spoke a little about the curriculum and mathematics. The major thing here in, a, in the classical education is it completely changes around um, the order of which education is done in the way of the expectations of the teacher, the, st the student, and the parents. The number one um, member of the education is the student. In classical education, in kindergarten, the student is taught. They are the ones that are responsible for their learning. It is not the teacher's job to force the knowledge into their brain. It is taught that parents have got to be an active member of their child's education. It is not a situation where you can drop your kid off at 8 o'clock in the morning, pick them up at the bus stop or afterwards, and then be upset with a teacher because maybe they have an F. You are engaged in your child's education. The teacher's role then moves into a position of being an advocate for the knowledge. They give the parents and the teacher and the students the resources to, to become a good student. It, it, it's kind of that three-legged stool, uh, three stool theory. So foreign language um, is actually introduced in a classical curriculum very early. Kindergarten. Why are you introducing foreign language in kindergarten? Because that is when the portion of your brain is more susceptible and is an absolute sponge for language. 
Introduction of foreign language, our curriculum offers French or Spanish. Um, the curriculum uh, school uh, suggests that we pick what makes most sense for our, our area. We have just chosen to do Spanish. When you introduce foreign language early, it's much easier for a student to learn, uh, for, pick a foreign language back up later in life if they feel that they've, they've lost it. Greek and Latin are introduced in, uh, in fourth and fifth grade. This is excellent for helping to define speech, helping to increase uh, uh, reading abilities. But the other thing that it does is um, anybody who, uh, who knows Spanish, I wish I do, I don't, Anybody that knows Spanish, if they're in a situation where they're speaking to somebody in Italian, there are so many similarities that you can usually get by. You also find that, I know that for us, when I was in high school, we had an Italian foreign exchange student and we had a had a had one from Argentina. And it was funny because watching them talk Italian and Spanish back and forth to it, but they completely understood each other. They usually when they were wanting to say something that us people who only spoke English didn't want to know. Um, but anyway, the other thing that it does is by by adding the Greek and Latin is, because you're understanding those uh, those basic uh, those basic rules, when you're introduced to foreign language later in life, whether it's in college, whether it's in high school, it's much easier for you to learn a completely separate language that has Latin and Greek as its basis. So, if you've learned Spanish and then Italian is offered to you um, later, it's much easier for the student to pick that up. Usually, those students will in, um, will find that those options in, in college. Classical education limits technology. So when we say limit technology, wearable tech and personal phones have no place um, in our classrooms. They are an absolute distraction. Any math teacher will tell you, it's probably nice to have all the extra calculators, but with those phones come, it's easier for students to be where they don't, where they shouldn't be on their phone. Whether they're downloading an app that will just give them the answer, or whether they're just off in YouTube or something like that. So the removal of that uh, distraction from the classroom is key. The other thing that it does is it removes, um, it, computers are still utilized, but they're utilized as a research tool only. They are not used to do all of your work. We are seeing a huge um, increase in AI. Um, we're seeing a lot of students across the country who AI is writing all their papers. Of course, there are uh, plagiarism software and stuff like that, but it's moving faster than what that, that software can detect. It's robbing kids of the ability for them to think deeply and do the work themselves. The other thing that it does is um, I had the great opportunity of visiting a couple of these uh, classical charter schools across the country through our, through our network, uh, one in Idaho and one in Michigan. It is amazing when you get to the middle school level, uh, those kids are looking at each other between classes. They're not on their phones. They're engaged in the classroom because they are not texting on their phones. Uh, it's like when probably you were in middle school and much when I was in middle, in middle school as well. Um, the, it, it improves interpersonal skills. Um, it, it's amazing. There are school districts, public school districts all across the country who are, who are um, doing technology bans because of the benefits to the students. The results are proven. So the Hillsdale uh, member school curriculum that we utilize uh, is in use in schools all across the country. So 99% of schools that use the classical curriculum through Hillsdale have a, they have a graduation rate of 99%. The state of Oregon is an 81. What's key on this here is that both of these are post pandemic numbers. Hillsdale did not change their standards. They did not change the curriculum. We know that in the state of Oregon, many school districts promoted kids to graduation who were not ready to go, who before the pandemic, they were not set to graduate, but they graduated anyway because of the pandemic. This is a increase of the actual of the um, graduation rate. It was in the 70s historically and had been declining in the state for years. So that 81% is not really that impressive when you take into consideration the impact on of COVID. It also is a true graduation rate. Um, I know that Oregon use, likes to use a completer rate. This is not a completer rate. This is not modified um, diplomas. These are not modified curriculum. This is a true graduation rate. 63% uh, of Hillsdale members go on to college. Now, with a classical curriculum, you are not destined for college. You are not taught that you must go to college. 
you are taught to think critically and you're taught to, to reflect on where you want to go. Do you want to go to military service? Do you want to go into the trades? Do you want to go to college? Still significantly a number of them choose to go off to college. And then 1138 to, 100, to 1060 on your SAT scores. This of course comes down to the um, devotion to developing critical thinking skills. It allows students to look at problems and solve them um, more deeper. So why Whitmore? So I know that a few of you on the board knew Mr. Whitmore personally. For those of you at the board who don't, and those of you in the audience, Mr. Whitmore was a administrator and a teacher at Sisala School District for a number of years. He was an amazing man. I'm sorry, an absolutely amazing man. This man had every birthday, he was inundated with personal notes and cards because of the amount of people he affected um, as an educator. His students were reaching out to him 30 years after they graduated to tell him what they did for, uh, for them. We felt that providing this rigorous of a curriculum would be an absolute honor for him. And we are honored by the family who chose that the, they agreed to let our um, charter school take his name. So that is who Mr. Whitmore is. He is probably the most effective and beloved um, administrator the district has ever seen. And we've had some good ones. So that's saying something. So, of course, I know there's questions. All right, directors have any questions? Mr. Snedden? And for those of you who may not be familiar, I just want to clear it up right now. Eric is my nephew. He's my brother's son. He's also a first cousin to Katie Snedden, who is my daughter. Okay. So all the family connections out of the way. Small town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eric? Yes. Um, I would venture to guess that uh, upwards of 90% of the teachers that uh, work in a public school were students, were students in that public school. Do you plan to have teachers who have been educated in the classical education style? Uh, yes. Teaching? Teaching? And where will you find those? Uh, George Fox has a classical education uh, curriculum. Classical education is actually the fastest growing um, curriculums, uh, multiple people are offering it, a curriculum across the country. Public schools are adopting them as well, usually smaller public schools. Um, there is universities out of Texas, Hillsdale College themselves have a classical curriculum. Um, we also find that teachers who graduated probably before 1992 have a lot of classical education, had more of a classical education model um, taught to them um, in school. So, so, so you'll be using certified teachers. Yeah, so um, in Oregon, um, you don't have to use 100% certified. So what most charter schools choose to do is um, a great example, and I give his name not because he's committed, only because he comes to mind. But um, if Tom Grove, when he retired from the bank, if generally in a, in a public school, what will happen is somebody needs to take, teach economics. It usually falls to a health teacher or a PE teacher that may not have the skills to teach economics. They have the time. It's very difficult for a public school to allow somebody from the community who's recently retired, who spent a whole life in economics to come and teach. Without the, the freedom that's given to a charter school is we are able then to go to people who have those specialties. That individual wouldn't teach all year. It would, he, would, he or she would teach a section or a chunk of the year under, um, under a teacher, but it allows us to bring that expertise into the school. So, so how, how much orientation will your uncertified teachers receive prior to being let loose on students? Your, your state, whatever your state requirements are. Um, they're, most of their um, certification comes from their world, real world and their, and their former career or their active career. So what you're saying, there, there is a process to, there's two categories with the teacher's standards and practices. There's certification and registration. So that you're saying in that case, you're talking, they would go through the process to be registered with the standards. Yeah, so we would follow whatever, we will follow the, the clear um, instructions of the state that yeah. gives. Yeah. And do you have a target ratio? We do not. Uh, just to clarify on your question, uh, I think what Director Armendaris is kind of probing for is what kind of classroom management skills would, would these people uh, actually have? Sure. Actually, training or, or skills yeah. would they have? So a teacher who graduates from a classical education school still, you know, they, they still come with the qualifications of, of their teacher teaching credential. Um, 
most schools that utilize outside outside resources for um, for teaching particular uh, subjects or um, a section of a subject, um, they do go through um, vetting through, of course, the charter board, but then, of course, also through through the state. So through that process, we will develop um, classroom management, and those they'll also be there with a um, with somebody who has. Those. So they're not going to be in a. They're not going to just show so up and start you, teaching. It sounds like on the job training. Well, if I'm having somebody come in and do tech economics, you know, you to be a great teacher sometimes just comes with with passion uh, for what you know. So um, I don't think that it's one of those things where to say that on the job training isn't doing justice to these to these people who are are professionals in their field. I mean, I guess I would make the comment that if the person is being supervised and you're taking a president of a large banking institution and having to come in and speak on economics, what more would you really need as long as that person is being supervised? They're going to be far more capable of handling that the academic situation, the teaching to the student level than a health teacher, as the example was what, what was given. So it would be real world economics. We also, in, in Oregon, you can be a substitute teacher with um, with basic, with education, an education milestone met. So you can just have a bachelor's degree and still be allowed to go into um, and start teaching. Eric, okay. I, I have a question. Director Pamela. Um, Eric, one thing I didn't see is location, physical location. Do you have something in mind? We do. We have a couple options. Unfortunately, um, until you have an authorization, um, really doing negotiations on any spaces or anything like that is problematic. So uh, we do have two locations that are identified um, that we're working on as soon as we're able to um, to know how what our uh, forward motion is that we can actually enact those. I would imagine that would probably also uh, rely on the number of students that you're anticipating as well. Correct. Do you have an idea of how many students you're anticipating? We anticipate the first year that we would have um, 15 to 25 per grade level. Okay, and you're, you're K through five at this point. K, K through six. K through six, sorry. Okay. sorry. We may choose to adjust that downward depending on um, space that we're looking at and, of course, uh, consulting with um, Hillsdale and also just looking at where we're at. So. so when we talked originally about policy and law and getting this established, one of the key factors was the submission of an application and very specific elements. Um, now, the presentation you made tonight was not the application that you submitted to the district office in March. So I was supposed to have 30 days to review this application. So again, I have a, I'm not going to pepper you with sure. all of the um, charter school pieces that are not in this presentation, but are not in your original application either. Um, and I'm, a charter school in and of itself is an experiment. It's how do you do everything a public school does, but better or differently. Correct. And so there's a number of, again, like budgetary elements that aren't here, policy elements that aren't here. And so, again, I, I don't know what the board's going to decide, but I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't meet legal sufficiency for a full application. So there's going to be a need for revision. I can give you a list of all of the things that I noted from your original application that I can infer that are things there, but they're supposed to be thoroughly delineated out and are not there. And that would be great because we actually, with from when we submitted this, we actually were expecting if there was anything deficient that we would have already received it so that we could actually um, address those for you. So if whatever's deficient, we certainly want to know that so that we can address those. Okay, yeah, because I've got, again, because again, we start, I've got, I mean, nine pages of questions from the first one about, point specific things that you have to address that aren't here. And, and that's fantastic because we want to know that, of course. But again, we were coming in tonight from when we turned this application in, we would have we actually expected any 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 missing materials we would have already had communicated to us. So um, we are happy to get to work on those uh, and uh, get those solved with you. Oh, that's a little hard for me to do because, again, I got a different application than what was submitted tonight. So. So yes, this is not the application. That's not the application. This is our presentation. You yeah. can, the application okay. was submitted to you guys right. um, already. 
so this is just highlights of of um, the charter school itself. Um, so the uh, application you guys have had for a yeah. number. I do have a couple of questions, and I think some of what uh, Mr. Gaskoyak was because well, this to, this presentation has yeah. materials in it that aren't in the application. Yeah. Um, it's a little hard to track. On on the application itself, on page three, you refer to an attachment A, and on page five, you refer to an attachment B. And the page three is on the governance, and on page five, it is on the core knowledge. And those attachments, what I've seen, they're not in there. So, okay. Yeah. So, what can you give those to me again? Uh, page three, you refer to in the other category of governance uh, is attachment A, the governance structure of the public charter school. And on page five, the subject is core knowledge. And it refers to a, uh, an attachment B. So right. we'll get those for you. Yeah. I had a question. Yes. Uh, in the in the application that I saw, I think it was like eight administrative positions that were listed. Are those eight different people, or are they combined? And if you t take those eight people plus, but if you have um, two teachers eventually per grade, that's several teachers. Um, so a couple questions regarding that. Uh, do you have sort of a budget that includes all that, that that makes sense for all those people? And how many of those people would be licensed through TSCP? Yeah, so early TSCP. on, early on, the head of school is going to wear a, a number of hats. Um, as the uh, school grows, then, of course, with, you know, as the budget allows, we'll be able to separate some of those um, positions out. So early on, the head of school will have um, a lot more um, to do, most like in, in small districts. Um, your superintendent wears many, many hats. So, um, yes, we'll get those that information for you. How many are licensed through TSPC? So we have to get there. I, our our head of school will most certainly be. Um, and then as we go to uh, expand out and take administrative roles, separate administrative roles out, then of course we will look at those and how and how that is affected. I imagine many of the questions that people have, you just physically can't can't answer sure. yet because you don't know what you don't know. And it's our understanding that through this whole process with the board is that we continually yeah. answer those. Um, I had a couple of questions, a couple of things, specific items in the in the application. Uh, one of them is hair and grooming. Uh, pretty, pretty straight down the line, the boys will have off the collar, traditional haircut. Uh, how how do you address somebody of another culture, uh, maybe African American or Native American, uh, who would who would be enrolled in the school? And their culture is the hair is is quite different often. Yeah. So the state has very defined um, rules on that. So appropriate accommodations will be made. Okay. Yeah. So we just that is where you follow the state guidance. Do you think by publishing that in your guidelines, do you think that might discourage people of color or uh, uh, no and it, and it hasn't nationwide no okay. um so this is so our policies that we have put together are utilized in a number of schools i think that that one actually um we have a number of schools that are part of this network that are in um uh in the south and in the mid-atlantic and stuff like that where you have many different cultures and yeah. stuff and they're able yeah. to adjust for reasonably make accommodations for those some of the some other questions I had, uh, and it's been a, a big topic tonight: special needs students. Um, if you get a hundred students enrolled, the st the statistical average of of students who need extra assistance and special needs is about fifteen percent. So, if you have a hundred students, you're going to have fifteen students. In, uh, what kind of accommodations are you going to have to provide the additional learning? For these sure. Kids? So the state, of course, sets that roadmap for you. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually just back in Michigan at a uh, conference, and that actually topic came up because every state, of course, is, is a little different. Mm -hmm. The key takeaway from that is that no matter what the limitation might be, that we keep the students in the classroom with their peers and then give them accommodations within the classroom as much as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. What we have found with what other schools have found is students that may be nonverbal coming in by keeping them in the classroom and keeping them with their, their peers, 
it, it might take a little bit longer, but they do go from being nonverbal to verbal. Um, I know from previously the parents who, who've, who've spoken um, about the, how, how special needs is, is key for everybody to thrive. That is not lost on this curriculum. This curriculum is there to better and to educate every single person. Uh, we've heard from this side of the table. Mm -mm. You haven't heard from me yet. Well, you chimed in. No, I didn't. In response to one of Frank's, <laughs> but I'll get that. I'll give you an opportunity. But uh, Director Lacatour, Pim Lott, or Director Snedden, you have anything you want to chime in with? The beauty of not chiming in first is the questions that you had were asked by others. <laughs> <laughs> I take that as a no comment. Daniel Jim. I, I don't want you to feel obligated to. I just want to make sure you had an opportunity. Director Katie? Um, you mentioned that you've got two possible locations. Um, and I know that there's a lot of balls in the air, but would you, can you share those with us? Um, we don't want to um, run the risk of somebody swooping in and nabbing them. So, And that's, that's reasonable. <laughs> Director Barnett. That's real life. That is real life. <laughs> Um, I was after re reviewing, reviewing the packet, some of my questions have, have been answered, but I know after reviewing the packet and reviewing the pros and cons letters, the between the two, it generated a few questions for me. Um, can you explain the charter school stance on religion taught in the classroom and how that's applicable to the classical education? Absolutely. So the state of Oregon has very clear defined rules. You cannot be a religious school and receive public funding. The state also is very clear that there are historical events that have happened through time that revolve around religion. Our curriculum does um, touch on historic events. I think what happens to some people is they see a time or a place or they see a buzz, buzzword that is related to a religion and they tend to gravitate and think that it is a religious course. And that is not the case. When you, deep, when you dive deeper into what the curriculum is and see what is being taught, you're merely just seeing a, a time in history where there was a lot of religious events, whether it, you know, you name the religion. Um, it's all happened through history, and it's all taught it, uh, in that scheme. Okay. And, I, and then another question I saw that was kind of a, a appeared to be a, a common theme is student selection. It seems like there was some, whether it's a lottery, whether it's open enrollment, or how the lottery, if there is one, can you add just some, some clarity to that? Sure. So our first step is open enrollment. Um, that's always the key. That's where we want to be a school of choice. So parents who wish to come and bring their student to, to Whitmore Academy then is able to. If we reach capacity, we fo then follow the recommendations from both the state and also through the Oregon League of Charter Schools. And that is when they that is that you move into a lottery situation. A lottery situ situation removes, it doesn't matter your financial um, status in life. It doesn't matter your race or your, or your gender. It's just lottery. To dive into that a little bit more, there is ways to weight um, the lottery. If you are a parent who has somebody who's in preschool today and you have a student that is in fourth grade, um, for ease of the family um, and for continuity, um, the parents who already have students within the district, it's adjusted in that lottery. But other than that, is a, it's just a strict lottery if we if we exceed capacity. Okay. So lottery only comes in to play if we exceed seats. Um, okay. Thank you. And another question I'd have, and and I know this was a little bit a little bit di difficult to read in, not read, uh, but I want to make sure I understand it in regards to. Sorry, let's get up some feedback there um the late pickup charge if let's i saw it like they're at 335 if they're 10 minutes late how is that enforced is it selective is it how how's that work so we do have a policy that if you're repeatedly late picking up your child that negatively affects staff it, it also negatively affects your child there is a uh a minimal uh a punitive fee that's attached to that to people who are constantly 
um, picking up their children late. You know when your kid's done, you need to be accountable to your child. Your child needs you to be there when they need you to be there. It is just a small financial reminder that if you repeatedly are showing up 30 minutes late, for anybody who's coached, they know, you know, life happens. You know, a parent randomly late once in a while, it happens. You're not going to be penalized. Um, I think a great example of this also, is not that's not a, a fee, but I know growing up, if I got dropped off late, one of my parents had to come into the school and sign me in. Um, I was actually surprised to find that that's not the case in most schools anymore. You can just pull up and drop off and send them off. This curriculum does require if your kid is, if your student is late, you do need to come in and you do need to sign them in. And what we have seen is it changes uh, the accountability for parents across the country. Um, there is one example of a school in Idaho who there was a very upset lady because she always had to sign her, her student in and she was yelling at the uh, um, at the front office lady and the principal went out and said, I don't understand what the issue is. And he said, you don't have to sign your student in every day. You only have to sign your student in if you're late. So just come drop them off on time. That So that was a, it was a reasonable request and it was accommodated. And so though that's the idea behind it. We don't expect to use it. Um, it is just there. It's no more than any child care service, um, a daycare service or anything like that. You'll you'll run into that as well. I wanted to follow up on the on the fee thing. You're saying that it's in the policy. It clearly says if you are one minute late, it's gonna cost you 10 bucks and then a dollar a minute after that. But what you just said was you know, you know, if if you do it once or twice, we're not going to charge you. So is that going to be communicated? Because yeah, it's just one of those things. I mean, it is real life. Um, yeah, I know that there are policies in every in every profession, in schools, and in in private world and stuff like that. You know, we could be bears. Is that going to be great for the student? Is that going to be great for yeah. our culture? Is that going to be great? So obviously, parents who are you know, you're not just smacked with a fee. You know, there's definitely yeah. multiple times. So, there's so if you're 30 minutes late picking up your kid, uh, I just did the calculation in my head. Yes, I can do that. All right. <laughs> That's $39. You're going to make them pay the $39 for they can take their kid? No, you obviously will just be put on the No more than if you yeah. don't return a school book in fourth grade, you don't pay yeah. for it until you graduate. So yeah. I do have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, one of the concerns that I saw come through was the relative risk of, you know, of a new startup. Lean in. Okay. The risk of a new startup and the um, the chance that that we may disrupt students' education if, for whatever reason, you're fa you fail. So I'm assuming that you've done some budgetary um, predictions that you've looked at our population and you've made some estimates. Um, are those are those true estimates? How did you estimate your your student base? So we went off of um, we actually did a survey of uh, families, um, and based off of the amount uh, we based that off of parents who've clicked on the intent to enroll within our district. A majority of those um, families who clicked on that intent to enroll have already unenrolled from Sayus Law or from surrounding districts, um, and or they have children who are getting ready to come into kindergarten. They're not yet school age. So they're looking, they're looking forward. So we were able to take that information of non-district students and then also base what we think um, will peel off in, from the district itself. And again, it's important to remember that just because a student comes over to the charter school does not mean that the school district loses all those dollars. So, yes, and so we'll get that piece um, yeah. to you. Can you explain that just in a little bit more detail in terms of if, if the students come from the public school sure. into the charter? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll give an example of if a, if a student comes from another district and comes to our charter school, then the dollars, so Oregon has made it very clear since 1999 that the dollars are attached to the student, not to the zip code, or I guess I should say the, the, the district. So um, if a student were to come from a surrounding community, then the district then would gain 20% 20 per, 20 of the dollars that, that, that represent that student, and then we receive the rest. If a student comes from within inside the district, the, the district uh, retains 20% and then passes along. So the state sends the funding to the authorizing district, and then the district keeps their portion and then funnels through to us. 
Right. Director Lacatour had a question sure. first, and then we'll go to Director Snippen. Again, the beauty of waiting and letting Diana go first is much of my question just got answered. Um, matter of fact, probably all of it. My question that I wrote down was, has there been adequate interest to meet your enrollment goals? But you kind of just answered that. So out of girl, Diana. <laughs> and most of our intent to enrolls are not district students. Um, they're either surrounding students or they're students getting ready to and, and again, those students are not guaranteed to CISH law to begin with. Um, they, those are families who are looking for alternatives, whether they cho are choosing, or whether they're seriously considering homeschooling from day one, or whether they're choosing to look at, I mean, we have families in the area who are driving their students to Eugene to private schools. We have, we see there's a charter school in Elkton who's pulling uh, families from um, the Valley and pulling families from the coast. There are people looking for classical education and, and the district will benefit um, from authorizing a charter that is teaching classical education because there are families looking for that option. We've lost medical professionals as just as short distance as Newport because of, of the option. So Director uh, my uh, my question, I, I had one about a survey and, and Diana started that for me. Um, so you've taken a survey. Um, is it possible, or maybe you don't know this information right now, so maybe you could get this to us. Could we know how many folks received that survey and then also what what number that is that was intended? Absolutely. Oh, okay, very yep. cool. Um, and was that, it, it was online, it was maybe through your website, or was there a targeted group, I guess, is what I'm wondering, or if it was... It was um, just conversations, you okay. know, okay. lovely foreign, small town, yeah, yeah, yeah. checking okay. out at the grocery store. Okay. Oh, I understand that you're interested in doing a, a charter school. Can you tell me more okay. about it? How do I enroll? And we would we gotcha. point out that, um, well, you can't enroll yet, um, but our website does have a intent to enroll because we can utilize that information. So um, we have not done a aggressive, wide... You know, we know that those numbers, of course, will grow when we do that. Uh, of course, we want to make sure that we are not creating false, I don't know, false hope or anything like that. Our goal here is to make sure that we move through every one of these steps methodically and smartly so that we don't fail, so that we do succeed and that we do benefit the community and we do benefit the district, but most importantly, that we are service, servicing the students within the district. I think that sometimes we can think that a school district's job is to only protect the schools that it runs. And that is not the case. Of course, you have, you know, fiduciary um, uh, things to abide by and you want to make sure everything's running right. But you are in school districts in the state are entrusted to serve the students of within that district the most efficient the and the best way possible. And mo many school districts around the state have found that they can do that by then offering charter school. There are many public schools who form their own charter schools. I have one more question. Sure. Okay. Um, the proposed curriculum, I, I'm assuming meets Oregon standards. It not only meets Oregon standards, but it exceeds. Okay. It actually exceeds every state in the union and every territory in the union. Okay. And then um, just my follow-up on that. Wait, real quick. I just want yeah. also to add to that. The curriculum also is built in because every state, of course, has their own requirements. Mm -hmm. So it does build in um, the places where Oregon history needs to find its way in. Okay. We work directly mm -hmm. with the curriculum to make sure that that is crafted at state um, to meet the state guidelines and then is inserted in the curriculum where the state wants it to be. Okay. Um, the reason I'd asked about the curriculum meeting standards was specifically the technology page and the the um, you refer to it as a personal technology band, which obviously is great, um, but just... Uh, are we talking computers are available for research? Is it a computer lab? Are there computers in the classroom? So our, our goal is to, we really like what a lot of schools have chosen to do. Mm -hmm. Instead of a central computer lab that I think people who went to school between 1994 and probably 2005 um, saw a stationary lab that you were kind of tied to. Um, our, what most classical charter schools are doing is putting um, computers in the classrooms for, for use. They're not typically laptops, though. They're more often desktops. And the reason for them being desktops instead of laptops is because we want to make sure the student actively goes over and utilizes the tool for research and then goes back and formulates their own thoughts, their own words, and then use the and uses the research they, they did to develop their wisdom. We don't want them sitting at a computer cutting, pasting, and then trying to make it sound like they use their own words or anything like that. So the technology point in the curriculum is still satisfied. We are just not 
putting a computer to a student. Um, they're there for access by all means. We, you in today's world, you have to know how to use technology. Another thing that is really interesting about, I'm gonna just jump back to Latin because of technology. Um, anybody who's ever written code, I don't understand it. It's ones and zeros to me. But when people who do understand it, if they can tell if somebody's received Latin, we've seen where people have actually um, compared code being written by somebody who knows Latin to the equivalent of a, of a poem or a sonnet to somebody who knows how to read code. So this is definitely not deficient in technology. It just changes the approach and it widens the abilities. All right. Um, I, I want to kind of wrap this up real quick because we have a whole lot of people here who came with the intention to speak to this issue. But real quick, Director Barnett and then Vice Chair. I've just got one, one last question. You spoke a little while ago about accountability. And one thing in this packet that I personally like to see, as especially speaking as a, as, as a parent of five kids that have gone through this, this school district, is when you talked about the reduction of the value you have a grade for late turn in work. Um, to me, that is accountability. Um, can you speak to how that that was formulated or what your guys thought process? Yeah, absolutely. Was so, of course, when I was in school, if you turned late work in late, it was you were uh, disc it was discounted. Um, it is a this is not a new thing. This is something that schools have been doing forever. I don't know why it's changed. I know that I've gotten kind of a few um, puzzled looks from my students teachers um, when I've asked them to discount their late work um, because I want that accountability. I want my students to understand that you have deadlines. You must you must meet them because you think about your um, your professional life. All of you have your professional lives. Um, you give up your time to come here. Think about if you were constantly turning work in late, if you were constantly turning work incomplete, if you were constantly just saying, I'm going to do the bare minimum, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't go, it wouldn't go well in your professional life. We've got to teach kids early. Um, and, you know, it very quickly shows students that when you have accountability and you have standards that are clearly um, communicated and then you're held to that standard, it actually takes some pressure off of the students. Right now, personally, I have a student who's allowed himself to get behind. He is under a lot of stress. And I've told him, this is what happens when you can't meet the deadline. So it is actually um, proven that students actually do much better when there is the accountability. And this is a great way to show it. So, John, I can actually answer that question for you. Is that docking a student's grade or denying them credit solely on the function of attendance is illegal in the Oregon Revised Statutes? And so you can have another penalty to encourage things to be turned in, but solely looking at a total number of absences and then denying credit or denying a, a credit for an assignment based on late work is is not within the Oregon standards. And so, of course, you know, it is always communicated. We will definitely communicate with students that if you know you're going to be gone, I mean, people get sick there, is, you know, but I remember when I was in school, if you know you're going to be gone, you were expected to have conversations with your teachers and you were expected to make sure the work was ready to go either before you left or, of course, the teacher is not always on the beck and call of the single student that you have made accommodations to make up that work uh, once you write back. Of course, that of course um, we're going to see that type of situation. I mean, speaking from my own students and my, under my own roof, there's been times where you they get where they're in the classroom, they're in, they're they're there, they're doing, they're they're present, they're not absent, anything like that, and they get one assignment behind. Next thing you know, they're two assignments behind. Next thing you know, it's easier to take the ostrich approach. But I think if there is some accountability for that, that like you said, it would, to me, would take pressure off the student if they knew that there was a cutoff deadline, like in the real world, preparing students for the real world. And in universities, I mean, it's the same thing. I, I understand that it can, on paper, it can seem, it can seem harsh, but the value in, in learning and learning that lesson in such an insulated and protected environment is key. Why learn that lesson in the real world? Um, why not develop it when you are in the in the nurturing care of a teacher in a classroom? Um, because then that it's not as negative and it's it's not as jarring. It's it's a best better place to learn that 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 uh, concept. Okay. Vice Chair Miltmerger. 
I just had a quick uh, question to follow up on uh, what Director said and asked earlier regarding uh, recruiting of people to attend. At the first, I believe you said something, um, you've recruiting them from all over, um, and then you said within the district, um, and in here it says something about a 10 mile radius. Could you enlarge on exactly where you're planning on getting students from and how they are going to be transported? Will they be using bus? Will the parents be transporting them? Sure, so we don't plan to recruit. Um, so, however, individuals who who want to bring their students uh, to uh, our our charter school, you know, so you have your inner ring and your and your um, at your outer ring. The in Oregon, you can, you know, choose where you want to to send your your student. If a student wants to come from, you know, X Y Z community, um, and we have room for them, uh, then of course we will uh, take their application. If they if we're full and we're in the lottery, then of course they'll they'll enter in. But we're not going to actively recruit, uh, nor are we actively going to uh, recruit recruit staff. I think it's key for the district to understand that we don't have an interest in recruiting from um, from your guys's organization on staff levels or anything. We're of course not going to tell any somebody no when they want to come to us, though. All right. Um, I've got a couple of questions I've jotted down here, but. There are questions that I'm going to email to everybody, and, and uh, but right now I think I, that I would like to move on to the public comment because I know there are a lot of people here who wanted to speak one way or the other. We have received the uh, the email comments and uh, the physical comments have been sent to us, uh, so don't feel like you have to come do it again, but you are welcome to talk about it. So thank you. Very yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you guys very much. Yeah. And I have, I have several of them here. I'm getting more as we go. Thank you very much. All right. And I have them in the order that we received them. So the first one that I have, uh, Ani Mill. Ah, and I will be running the clock. Okay, well then I'll talk fast. Okay. Dear school board leaders, as a parent, teacher, volunteer, and resident of the Sayusla School District, I am speaking to express my opposition to the proposed classical education charter who presented this evening. While proponents argue that this proposal would provide a tuition-free option, I see it as an attempt to create a private educational program that would benefit a limited number of students and families using public funds. As a district, we must prioritize inclusive and equitable public schools that serve all students students, regardless of their socioeconomic background and affiliations. I find it very concerning that the proponents of the charter school created an intent to enroll website to recruit students before presenting a proposal to the school board. This raises questions about transparency and their intent to bypass the public process. I urge you, our esteemed school board, to carefully evaluate any proposal that would impact the district's budget and resources with an ultra-critical lens. Fortunately, our school district recently collected data on thoughts and concerns of local families regarding our schools. This data will show that we need to improve our current facilities, promote positive interpersonal relationships, and emphasize applied skills and learning. As both a parent and a teacher, I know firsthand how important these goals are for our students' academic and personal growth. We need to make a renewed effort to renovate and replace our current high school and expand the sources of strength projects that address the issue of youth suicide, to which the families in our region are not immune. Let us invest in college and career exploration opportunities that inspire hope and optimism for our students' futures. I urge the school board to consider three critical questions when evaluating any proposal that will impact our district. First, would the proposed charter serve the best interests of all constituents and students, not just a select few? Second, would it prepare our students for the ever-evolving world of modern science, art, literature, and philosophy? And third, would it unite or divide our already struggling school district community? I ask you, our school board directors, to advocate for the best interests of all students and stand with your constituents and the students of the Sayusla School District. 
As Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Let us stand together to prioritize inclusive and equitable public schools that benefit all students. I'm going to leave you with copies, only five because my printer ran out of ink, and a short essay that I've prepared on how classical education institutions sponsored by, sponsored by the Barney Charter School Initiative have the potential to damage our greater public school systems. Thank you for your consideration, and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or concerns. My name is Annika Miller. Also, if I'm going to steal as much time, you tell me when I'm done. Okay, Sayusla students yeah. deserve professional, highly qualified teachers. Increasing options does not increase quality, but it does further divide limited resources and increased financial burden. A classical education is not what interests families who have chosen homeschool. This is another behind in seats option that does not meet the diverse, unique needs called for by many alternative educating families. And the number of homeschoolers who schoolers who will return will not recoup or offset those costs. And professionals are not attracted to quality or attracted to quality, not quantity. If you want students reading full text, studying fine arts and Greek and Latin, then make it a district policy. We don't need a separate institution to provide a cohesive, integrated education that is well-rounded. Same goes for technology bans and cutting off deadlines for assignments. Ms. Miller? Yeah. You were right on time until you added that last oh. script. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, and I... I see, I see a hand up. If you would like to speak, I need you to go fill out a chart. Well, all right. Well, the next up is Ada fowler Lacau. All right. And the next one on deck will be Amy Tregoning after that. So, Ms. fowler Lacau. My name is Ada Fowler, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. That last comment was well said and very articulate. I will be brief. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I urge you to vote to accept the proposed charter that is being presented tonight. This charter will be the starting point to establish a charter school in Florence. This is a positive step that will offer a choice in the educational process for parents and children in Florence and surrounding areas. Choice can enhance our current school system and the charter school itself. This relationship will stimulate the best of both. We are a community of choices. We know how to work together to include all residents of diverse preference. I am a longtime resident of Florence. I've lived here since 2000. I'm a parent, a grandparent, and a retired educator of 24 years. I approve the charter school. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Fregoni. And on deck will be Greg Jorgensen, Mr. Goning. All right, I wish we had a timer up here. Um, thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk tonight. I'm gonna talk as fast as I can because I don't know if I can contain this for three minutes. Um, really, I was gonna talk to you guys kind of about what's going on in our community or what we're seeing in our community because it is a divide. Uh, Annika Miller, thank you. Um, we are seeing a divide in our community which we are seeing in our classrooms. As loud as it's getting in the community is 10 times what we're seeing in the classrooms. The behavior has oh, exploded, I guess I could say. Um, and if I follow this, it'll make more sense. Uh, okay, so we've seen an uptick in behaviors, uh, some very physical, some very hateful, kindergarten on up. I'm not saying it's all kids because we have amazing kids and I introduced one tonight. Uh, challenging behaviors have increased and intensified. The thing is, <laughs> we're doing everything we can in the school. Um, I know the school board's working hard on it too. The struggle continues to be intense. It's not just the school, it's the community. We are not failing as a school. 
we are failing as a community. We are being loud. Our kids are hearing it. We're letting our kids hear it. We're letting our kids bring it into the classrooms. So we've got this divide and part of it has to do with, and I'm sorry, the election, it is. We've got hate on both sides and it's coming into our classrooms. And as middle schoolers, when it's coming into our classrooms, it's highly inappropriate for me to be hearing kids be this angry about something they can't even vote on. Um, charter school is the other one. Um, it's definitely caused a lot of confusion and division with us. Uh, there was mention of it a long time ago. There was a website, it disappeared. We didn't have access to it. I had to ask for access to it, um, or I had to ask for access to the proposal because I had no idea what was going on. I, most of us weren't even told that it was happening. Um, the question is, why do we need it? I get that it's a choice, but reading through the proposal, it is not equitable for students. Um, I know I've got some stuff in here too, but. Uh, Mr. Draconi, you have a minute left. I have a minute left, okay. So let's see, I come from a science background, so I'm constantly looking for solutions to problems. Right now we've got a problem and we need to come up with a solution. Uh, if anybody has questions about what I'm teaching, because I feel like that's part of the reason that this proposal is in, um, there's misconceptions about what's happening at the schools. Ask, ask me what I'm doing. Look at the website, look at our curriculum. We're not hiding anything. Please come talk to us. If there's a misconception about science or health or anything, come talk to us. Um, I'm happy to talk to adults all the time. Like I love to talk, my husband will let you know. Um, <laughs> but what we're getting right now is a lot of anger and it's hurting our teachers. And if you wanna know why teachers are leaving, it's because this is a struggle, behavior is a struggle. Dealing with outside forces, pushing hate on us and telling us that they love us and yet, okay. And yet uh, I lost it yeah. with that. I'm sorry about that. But anyways, I appreciate you guys. All right. Thank you for letting us talk. Thank you. Now I wanna, I wanna make it clear to everybody, Mr. Jorgensen, uh, on deck will be Michael Allen again. Okay. And, uh, just a reminder, we do have all of the comments that have been submitted to us previously, and we are taking the comments in the order that they requested that they came in. Mr. Jorgensen. My comments are personal. Uh, before I get into that, though, it's Teacher Appreciation Week, so child care, thank you. With, with child care. That's personally offensive. Um, as someone with luxurious locks themselves, I am here to talk about hair and the hair policy. Uh, the purpose of public education is inclusivity. The key word is public. We don't limit, sorry, limit those we wish to serve. We go out of our way to reach them and access them. That is why I am here to speak in opposition to the proposed charter school. Looking at their information policies, I see many instances of discrimination that look to violate both district policy and state law, but I wanna focus on the one most personal to me hair. Now I come from a culture where long hair is not valued on men. That's me and that's my heritage. This is not the same for others though. And it's for those that I stand up for and speak up for today. Well, that might not have been my upbringing. It is for my sons and many other native youth where long hair is part of the cultural identity. In this district, my children are not, not alone. There are many native youth that our district serves, and this makes the dress code proposed discriminatory towards them, as well as others whose race or ethnicity values long hair. Public schools do not discriminate. This proposed charter school does. Please vote to decline the proposed charter school. It is bad for our district, and it is bad for the kids we serve. They deserve better. Thank you. Mr. Allen? the trifecta and following him will be pat reno well, well thank you again for this opportunity to follow up on my remarks that i made earlier regarding a youth climate advisory committee just as long as they're directed to the charter school application exactly they're related well my name is michael allen i, I should preface my remarks by saying that i really appreciate eric snedden's articulation of his proposal. I work with Eric when we are actually working to build a new high school during the bond issue. He was articulate then and is now. 
In reviewing the charter school application, I found it contains a policy for controversial subjects that states, quote, controversial issues will be explored only when emanating from some part of the curriculum in grades nine through 12. Think about that. Contemporary issues will not be discussed in the elementary school without principal approval, end of quote. This policy begs the question, will the issue that I bring to you, climate change, be part of the charter school curriculum? Most likely not. I can conclude that students like climate activist Bias Stout that I talked to you about earlier would not have their say in this sub on this subject. Charter schools are not accountable to the public or to pub publicly elected school boards. This charter school wishes to narrow the curriculum and not offer a diverse one that allows the unfettered examination of major issues of our day. Some of those con con controversial issues mentioned in the charter application were religion, previously discussed, human sexuality, and would you believe evolution? I worked on the issue of evolution back in the 80s, and I think we solved that problem. I add that to that list, climate change as a controversial issue. For this and for other reasons, I should add another reason being that there's a burden of having to wear a uniform as part of their proposal. I urge you to reject the charter school application. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up is, is Pat Reno, and following Pat will be Dolly Carp. My name is Pat Reno, and I live in Florence. My comments relate to the proposal of a charter school in Florence. My first question is why? Establishing a charter school would only take away a number of things from our current school system, especially funding for our teachers and administrators, and neg negatively impact any bond measures we require for future building improvements. Where will this charter school administrators and teachers to staff it? It is difficult enough for our current school system to hire and retain quality teachers when salaries are not competitive and there is no adequate affordable housing for them now. Where will they get the money to build and maintain a new physical structure? Our current school system has had bond measures for a new high school denied the last two times we tried to have the voters approve such a measure. Will we never be able to have a new high school because of fundraising? for a new physical building for the charter school. If you have some issues with our current public school, work within the system to change those things you don't like. Become active in the school, become a volunteer, run for the school board of directors. This is a much more feasible way to affect change than opening a new school. Whitmore Classical Academy is proposing to use curriculum, which has been developed by Hillsdale College, a Christian conservative college. In reading through the materials, it is obviously obvious that the curriculum has an agenda of teaching conservative Christian thinking. Their website states that the Constitution has been undermined for over a century by, by progressivism and post-1960 liberalism and how limited government under the Constitution might be revived. It also touts their extensive conservative right-wing library, including the complete writings of William F. Buckley, Jr. In reading through the curriculum and rules for the new charter school, students will be required to wear uniforms that are clean and pressed at all times. If a student in younger grades has an accident and soils their uniform, parents will be called and required to bring a new clean uniform for the student or the student will be sent home. How many uniforms will each child be required to buy in order to comply with this requirement? How many parents will be able to afford this? How many parents will be able to drop everything to bring a new uniform to school? Presumably, overwhelmingly, 
white well-to-do parents, certainly not the 43 homeless children we currently have in our school system. From a curriculum standpoint, and I, I understand what you were saying about Latin, but I was amazed by the fact that Latin is required beginning in the fifth grade through ninth grade. Latin is a dead language. I took it in high school in the early 60s. English belongs to the Germanic language brand, branch of the Indo-European language. Learning Latin does not help students learn how to read, write, or comprehend. Ms. Reno, there are many other areas. Two time. We'll one, just one second. Yeah. There are many other areas of the charter school program regarding discipline, grading that does not match state requirements, the inability of students, of teachers to speak about their personal life in a small town, which is impossible, and other things that do not fit within our community. Even if I was in favor of a charter school, this would be the last one I would choose. I urge the board to vote against a charter school. All right, next up will be Dolly Karp. And before we move on, uh, Jeannie Owen had called requesting to speak. Is Jeannie here? No, oh, okay, all right, thank you. But we do have a few more after this. So uh, Ms. Karp, then on deck will be AJ Edmund. Good evening. My name is Dolly Karp, and I'm here representing my husband, Robert Karp, who is serving on the Florence City Council. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here this evening uh, because he's at City Hall working on the budget. He asked me to state his that he is fully supports the Charter School of Florence. Short and sweet. <laughs> Thank you. All right, AJ Edmund and Madison. I'm having a hard time reading the handwriting. Condi. <laughs> okay, thank you. Madison, you're on deck. So, AJ Edmund. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to express my strong opposition to the establishment of a new charter school in our district. Um, while I appreciate the importance of providing quality education, to all of our students, I believe that the resources and grants would be better allocated towards, that would be allocated towards this new charter school, that they'd be better served by funding a new high school. There is a difference between what our kids learn and whether or not they learn, and kids cannot learn if their basic needs like heat and indoor plumbing are not being met. As a parent of two high schoolers and three soon-to-be high schoolers, I have witnessed the dire conditions in which our students are expected to learn and the lack of heat during winter and the inadequate provisions of basic necessities such as working plumbing, uh, it's unacceptable. Um, the school district has attempted to fund a new high school several times in the time that we've lived here. <clears throat> and I don't have time to address why those measures failed, but I do have time to put a call out to those in the community of which the uh, the school board is, is also, are also members. Those who voted down past measures for whatever reason, um, among which are maybe you don't have children in the district or, um, or fear that it may displace or, or impact other businesses within the community. Um, it is time to put some skin in the game and make Florence better. If you do not, young families will leave. As stated earlier tonight, families are leaving and professionals as well. Without younger families or professionals to supplement the work local workforce and keep this town running and growing, Soon you may find that you won't have access to caregivers when you get sick, servers to staff your favorite restaurant on Bay Street, builders to build you a new home, and on and on. Investing in our community, starting with a new high school, is vital to the long-term sustainability of Florence. And in terms of impacting uh, other established businesses, we want Florence to grow. It's not taking a piece of your pie, it's making the pie bigger. Um, I urge the school board to prioritize the needs of our existing students and invest in a new high school facility that will provide a safe and comfortable learning environment for all. While the establishment of a new charter school may seem like an attractive option, it should not come at the expense of neglecting uh, our existing students. Let us work together to provide the, the best possible education in a safe and healthy environment. I urge you to vote no on the charter proposal. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Madison Condi is next, and on deck is Berkeley Tregoning. I saw a head snap there when I said that. Madison? Hello. Jesus. You can hold it if you'd like. Okay. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Madison Ann Condi, and I'm a student at Sayusla High School. And I'm here to oppose the charter school. Um, I have questions about the hair and dress code and how it's going to address trans kids. And also how the school is going to deal with no divergent children and um, with the limited technology, will it be, will it have some sort of computer class? Because we're going into a digital world and people need to know how to use a computer effectively. And I know you said it was for mainly research purposes, but like my bad handwriting suggests, I have to type a lot of my things or else my teachers cannot read it. They're pretty good at it most of the time, but how will you accommodate people like me with that, with things like anxiety and as someone who has been to a charter school before i know you're trying to be as inclusive as possible but it's hard because my experience with the charter school is is that a lot of the times certain teachers it's it wasn't very accommodating for me and i'm worried about the kids for at this new proposed charter school and God dang it. Um, I'm not very good at public speaking. Um, You're doing a pretty good job so far. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, Berkeley Tregoning and on deck is Alicia Hernandez. And I don't have any more signups. Uh, so this is your last call. If, if you would like to speak one way or the other on the charter school proposal, please quickly go fill it out and get it to Mrs. McClellan so we can hear from you tonight. Berkeley? Uh, I'm here to oppose the, the charter school. So, sorry, I'm, not, I'm also not very good at public It's okay. You're just talking to us. Okay. The reason that I want to oppose this is because I don't believe it's necessary. I believe it's opening up a school, another option for schooling for students who are already doing well in school. And I don't believe that that's quite necessary. About like the late work policy and enforcing punishment for that, I understand the wanting to teach students about the real world, the future, but a lot of students can't get to that point where they're going to have a successful future if we are constantly just failing them for not being able to turn in work on time. I'm on a 504 plan that says that I can turn in my work late. And that's very important to me because a lot of time, if I fall behind, I'll just get more stressed about it and just keep on going behind. So it's very important to me that I actually have the opportunity to turn this stuff in. And a lot of students can't get their work in on time because of reasons outside of school, like at home. Some students don't have homes and don't have the opportunity to get their work done. And yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. Okay. Thank you, Burke. Thank you, Berkeley. Uh, Alicia Hernandez. And I think we're getting one more on deck, so she knows she's on deck. So, Ms. Hernandez. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so, I am Ms. Hernandez. I teach Spanish at the high school, and I also have two students who are graduating this year. Um, and I just want to say that I oppose the charter, but I also want to talk about trustworthiness because a year ago, in about October of last year, we were asked to move out of our housing situation, <clears throat> excuse me. And so we were told that, oh, well, you know, they're gonna do housing for teachers. So get on the list. So I was 
My husband, who's here, was the first one to call and get on this list. Come around February, they told us, oh, we're going to get back to you in February. And it was Mr. Snedden, Rx Snedden. And um, we were hopeful because we had a hard time finding housing in the first place. Um, there was a situation, so the landlord asked us for their house back because they were going through something. And um, so we we know the housing situation is dire in the community. I have two cats and two dogs, so people continuously shut us down for housing. They don't want pets. Even if you have the money to pay, you know, $400, $500 of pet rent, they don't care. They're not going to house you. And so we got lucky that we found this woman. I was on Craigslist every day, hours after work, hours after all the school work I do. And then um, found this woman and she, she's, I, you know, begged her. I said, we really need housing. You know, this is a situation. We have two cats, we have two dogs. And she said, well, okay, I have a sweet spot for teachers. So I'm going to let you have this place. But then um, they, you know, we were, we said, look, it, it'll be temporary because we're on this list. So we're going to wait. And, and we have, um, we're number one on the list. Well, come February, nothing. We hear nothing. And we're like, okay, you know, the end of the year is wrapping around and we need housing because um, the place where we're at is going to be an Airbnb as soon as we move out. Um, so nothing. And then it was like, we were just put off the list. And I, my husband, I said, hey, can you call and find out what's going on? Because they, we were all first on the list to be offered a rental, nothing. So then he calls and he says, oh, I finally got home. And they just said, we're just off. No explanation, not really like a direct response to why we were put off the list. But I don't know about supporting educators. I don't know. I'm part of the community. I live here. I have students here. I'm a teacher. And to be put off the list to prioritize maybe someone who was going to come and work in your charter school, that makes sense to me. Self-interest. So it's concerning. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. I'm going to use the chair's prerogative and say these are our final two that we are accepting for speaking tonight. And I just want to make it clear that uh, any other input. Uh, obviously, we've got a lot of things to go through in this, and we're not going to, going to be making a decision tonight. I wouldn't be in favor of making a decision tonight. There's a lot of unanswered questions. So if you have something you would like to add to the conversation, you are welcome to send an email to through the website on the school district. Uh, Deborah Fisher and then Storm Kurt is on deck. Ms. Fisher? <laughs> Hi, I have lived here in this community since 2010, and um, I don't have any children in the school district, but I have a lot of nieces and nephews. And I just wanted to share an experience that my my um, one of my nephews is having in the charter school in Arizona. He was getting in a lot of trouble, and uh, my brother, my sister-in-law, were just really thrilled that they could actually put my nephew in a charter school, and he is just doing wonderful. And I think that everybody should have a choice. And my brother, my sister-in-law make the sacrifice. They have to drive him. It's not an easy task. He does have a dress code, so on and so forth. But I've seen a big turnaround in my nephew um, since he has been in the charter school. Now, obviously, we had some students here that were complaining about, you know, they need extra curriculum. They need extra time. to. Do. Well, then they're not candidates for a charter school. And that's okay. We live in the United States of America and everybody gets a choice. If they don't feel their child would do good in that situation, you know, uh, and a dress code and so on and so forth, then, then they still have this school just, you know, they still have choices in the school district. They don't have to go to the charter school. This is just for people that would like their children to go to the charter school, like my brother, my sister-in-law decided to do with my nephew. And I just want to tell you, it's just made a very big positive role in his life. And I think that Reedsport's a good example. They have a charter school. They're a smaller community than us. And they're doing, you know, that they have that choice. We should have that choice here in Florence as well. 
And I pay a lot of money in, in uh, property taxes here and I don't have children in the school. So, you know, so I think I have a right to say something about, you know, I live right here, right here in, 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 uh, in the, in the uh, city limits. So I just think it's a good thing. I think it will bring the standard of our um, education higher. I think it will actually get all the teachers that are, that are kind of been complacent up on board. Competition's good. That's what makes America, America. So I would ask you and urge you to please consider letting this charter school go through. Obviously there's some things that need to be, you know, ironed out as far as making sure that it's uh, compatible with our um, state uh, curriculum. And I'm sure Eric is gonna make sure that that gets taken care of, but I would really urge you to do that because there's people like my brother's son, Dominic, that's just thrived. And I, I don't know where he would have been without the charter school. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And we did have one more person who had filled out a form and we just didn't get it picked up. So Nancy Rickard, you are on deck, but Storm Kurt is up first. Hi, my name is Storm Kurt. I may have written that down wrong. I apologize. That's right. Don't apologize for that. Uh, I'm here to speak on opposing the new charter school. Our school district is already suffering because we don't have enough money. Our, the high school is not great. And we already don't have enough teachers for substitutes. And it's like, and how does this new school, the charter school plan to deal with transgender students? Because often transgender and disabled students are overlooked and they need to not be overlooked as often. And how does the new charter school plan to deal with like a music program? The Sayusla School District music program already doesn't have a lot of money. And we've had three band directors in the last four years, which isn't anyone's fault. But it's a struggle when we don't have a lot of money for funding for classes or extracurriculars already. And there's no need to take away that funding for an extra school. If we... The teachers in the school district are great and all of them work really hard for their students. And there's just no need for another school at the moment, especially when our school isn't doing well. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. And our, our final speaker tonight, a former school board member herself, Nancy Rickard. I had no intent to come here and speak tonight, but I feel compelled because of the, the problems that we have with people moving to Florence. They've retired in California and anywhere else, and they don't feel like they have to support the schools. I served on the committee when we, um, first tried to build a new high school. And it just, it's really hard to get people to get involved. They've retired, they don't want any part of anything anymore. And it costs our school. I came here in 1978, and I would like to see the new high school before I die. And <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Uh, directors, we've been going at this for quite some time. We uh, began the presentation an hour and a half ago, uh, and we have a lot left to do on the agenda. So uh, I would like to take a break. <laughs> Not just like to. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's make it 10. And Mr. Harkler Road, Right here, the high school principal is, he is offered to give a tour of the building here for anybody since you're here and it's available. He's offered to give a tour to anybody while we're doing the break. We will uh, reconvene at 8.40 p.m.
or you just approve uh, them on. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Okay. We are, uh, we shall reconvene this meeting. And thank you for you diehards who stayed with us. Um, there was some discussion during the break about maybe truncating this meeting in some way. And I think that's still an opportunity. But before we talk about that, I would like to move to 5.0, which is the consent agenda. And Mr. Guskoyak, would you care to talk to us about the consent agenda? Consent agenda, consent business, item uh, 051023 5.0. Uh, this month's consent agenda contains the following items, April 12, 2023 board minutes, April uh, 2023 financial statements, uh, 5.3 enrollment update, second uh, policy readings of a uh, policy early uh, return to work, um, and then a uh, policy uh, district improvement pr program, uh, policy uh, student health services and requirements, and policy on facility use. Administration recommends approval of the consent agenda as presented. Uh, board is reminded that any consent agenda items may require additional discussion and may be added as a regular item. I've been uh, had a communication earlier that there may be a uh, linear deletion requested in policy KG. A linear? Uh, all right. Mike, so, please. The mic microphone, yes. So if somebody wants to discuss anything on the consent agenda, now is the time to move to remove it from the consent agenda, and it would go on the regular agenda. Okay. What's your pleasure? Chair, may I please ask to have policy KG removed for additional dis from the consent agenda for additional discussion? All right. Motion has been made to delete KG from the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded to remove it from the consent agenda. And that does not require a vote. It is removed from the consent agenda. And we will talk about it later. So uh, back to the consent agenda itself. A motion to approve the consent agenda would be appropriate with the exception of removing policy KG from that consent agenda. Board Chair, we resolve that the Sias Fiscal District Board of Directors approve the revised consent agenda as presented resolution 05123-5.0 revised consent agenda. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda with the removal of policy KG. I did understand that correctly, right? Yes. All right, and seconded by Vice Chair Miltenberger. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimous. All righty then. So we have a whole bunch of policy, and it was a couple directors discussed it during the break to shorten our time here. Uh, directors, your policy on your, your your pleasure on continuing with the policy items, including KG. Uh, although, let me, Director Pimlant, let me ask you just real briefly, give me your elevator speech on your concern on KG. There's one sentence um, in the suggested language that I think that we can just eliminate. It's page 24. Um, remembrance events do not include a formal religious ceremony exclusive to one faith or acts of proselytism. Um, I don't think, I think it's redundant one because we've already stated above um, that remembrance events will be open to the public, may be spiritual in nature and are in keeping with the district's guidelines regarding a respect for and neutrality of religious beliefs. I also think that if we leave it in there, it will um, just lend to repeat confusion and possibly um, miscommunication in the future. All right. Well, I would recommend that we take up that discussion at a, a future meeting. But directors, what's your what's your pleasure? Do you want to go through these policies tonight, including KG? I'm seeing just one head saying no. When when would it then be when we we then discuss it in next month's regular meeting not next wednesday but in the well that's up for discussion what would you prefer i don't know that's why i was asking okay 
Director Barnett, you were the one that was shaking your head. No, what would you say? Yeah, I'm okay with moving this to, to June if that's the board's. Okay. Yeah, I would suggest you do that in June because then with KG, you can just reference that with the deletion of that line. You can uh, uh, basically reference it back to policy IGAC, which is teaching about religion. If that's just your cross reference, that would cover all of it in one shot. Okay. So. I do not believe we need a motion in this in this regard. Like, well, maybe it would be appropriate to make a motion because we did approve the agenda. So at this time, I would say it's appropriate to, uh, I would accept a motion to defer the action discussion on the policies 6.1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 6.1 and 6.2.2 that's all of the policy discussions yeah that, well that's the and kg as well yeah so uh, a motion to defer that to the june meeting and you can reference to the list i just said so moved all right is there a second second motion made by director snedden to defer the discussions and the actions on the policy issues that we identified and seconded by Director Barnett. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, aye. say nay. All right. So done. Thanks. So everybody. before we go to 6.3, there are no new policies to be discussed prior to the June meeting. So if there's any clarification or other requests for the policy committee to re review in June prior to the June board meeting, just let us know and we'll take what's here on this slate put it back, clean it up, bring it back for the okay. June meeting. All right. Thank you. Okay. 6.3. Finalize the budgets. Ms. Howell, Mr. Gaskoyak. Well, Ms. Howell doesn't get to talk that much and I spend way too much time talking. So I am going to defer to her on finalizing the budget. You can just grab that microphone and take it to your seat. Yeah. You don't have to have a special Can you hear me? technical okay. endorsement to, to, to touch it. be able to touch it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm bringing forward to you the final uh, finalization of the budget. And um, we um, went through the approval process on the 26th. We had our discussion. So now at the board, um, we're asking if there is any other further discussion um, and being able to move forward on the finalization um, for the June 14th meeting for the final adoption. All right. So I don't anticipate a very long conversation, but we'll go around the room. Any Director Armendares, do you have any? Okay. No, that I was, don't. All right. Director Barnett? Me neither. All right. Director Snedden? Uh, no discussion. Director Pimlock? No. Director Lacatur? I'm still going to be voting no. Um, I there's too many things in it that I don't agree with. I had a number of people ask me after the after the budget meeting um, why I would vote no on the budget, the the proposed budget, but then yes to maintaining the tax rate. And the reason there is because I clearly acknowledge, and of course we need funding um, as as the district, the, the teachers, the staff. You know, the the school needs funding, um, but there's 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 too many things that I disagree with as far as um, how how monies are spent. All right, Vice Chair Miltberger, no discussion. And I don't have anything either. So that's that's your directive. Is there anything else you feel you need? Thank you Grant, for your comments. No, not at this time. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. Six point four longitudinal growth performance targets. If that doesn't have educational ease all over it, I don't know that. So yes, um, long, longitudinal uh, growth performance targets basically is a strategic plan for looking at key uh, uh, academic indicators and looking at how they should be developing if we're making forward progress across the years. Now, as part of our um, strategic improvement plan and our um, required markers for um, our integrated guidance plan, uh, 
we've outlined, and this is in my board, uh, board report, and I think it is, uh, do we have that up on the screen? Um, she's, she's getting it. And we've got uh, a series of five required longitudinal uh, performance growth targets. And ODE has taken our last five consecutive years of uh, student performance goals um, for uh, these uh, markers. Um, again, it would be third grade English language arts, regular attendance, ninth grade on track, a four-year cohort graduation and five-year cohort completion. Um, I've also prepared a local option metric of four-year cohort completion, and then uh, move those out. Can we scroll to the uh, graphs, data trends? So uh, how this is represented, and if we look at four-year gra four cohort graduation, all right, we see um, for 2017, 2018 through 2021, actual year trends. And then we see what we call a gap closing target, which is what we are doing with all focal group students, students that are not in the majority of students. This is gonna be all minority, all underserved special education students. And what we're doing to bring them to the, the total trend on target, after those five years. And so looking at reversing any negative trend and reaching the growth rate of, you know, in essence, half of the top 10% of schools in Oregon is a baseline target. Stretch target is hitting that top 10%. And then gap closing would be taking that focal group and bringing it towards the majority. And this is what we will go into what we call co-development with ODE over the next month or so and bring this back to the board um, for final approval on whether you want to make these, which goals you want to be, again, the stretch or the baseline. Because again, if we're picking every single one as the stretch, we're going to do in this category what the top 10% districts are across all the categories. We're going to be spread too thin. You can't do everything all the time, but we can make progress. And everyone, what is going to be our primary focal goal of these five required targets? So uh, this is just the sample set uh, for preview um, and just following the trend for improvement from what we've had. Moving up, can we scroll from four-year to five-year cohort completion? This has been one where we've been above trend um, statewide. And again, looking at what it is for a baseline, what it is to stretch, and what it is to close the gap and bring students with disabilities and others up to the same marker as everybody else. Can we scroll to the next one, please? Oh, that was too far. <laughs> oh, there we go. Ninth grade on track. Um, again, we were we're using the five years of consecutive data. Uh, we do not have data for ninth grade on track for 2019-20 because it was not collected at the state level. And if we were to be bringing all students up to trend, you know, with a stretch target by 27-28, we would have everybody with, you know, six and a half credits at the end of the year. I mean, nobody ever failed the class in the freshman level by 27-28. Um, and then can we scroll to the next track third grade ELA proficiency. Again, uh, third graders were not tested in 2019 and 2020. So again, uh, going back, our trend is from 2015-16 up through 21-22. And then again, following the same pattern, setting target goals from 23-24 through 27-28. Again, I use the same kind of pattern before we go into co-development. If we're setting a baseline, looking at what the top 10% dis how they grew over that period. And then if we're going to stretch it, if we hit the top mark for all 10 to all top 10% districts over that time. And can we scroll to the last one, I think, please. Oh no, we got one more after this. So regular tenders. Um, again, there are 
five consecutive years through 2016, 17 through 21, 22. Again, we've got some uh, illness and pandemic trend in there. But again, looking to get attendance back on regular track across the board. And then I don't know if the board want, we've discussed this a few times, but I don't know if, it, if we've made an official decision on, on bringing this forward, but um, can we scroll to four-year um, cohort completion? Uh, there was a little, um, and again, education lease is unfortunately what I speak sometimes, is that modified diplomas are real regular diplomas, okay? GEDs are counted towards completion. Modified diplomas are real regular diplomas. They are part of the graduation cohort. They are also part of the cohort completion. Okay, but modified diplomas are real regular diplomas. Okay. So in our four-year cohort completion, this would include students that may have graduated early or graduated with a GED right, and not a traditional diploma or a multiple credit diploma that just has a different number of units per subject area. Okay. And so again, uh, being on target would put this all these groups back to 84% at a minimum, 27, 28. And so this is one that we have, again, I just had to go through and hand pull all this data and ODE is, I sent it back to evaluate and said, is this the group that you're looking at when you talk about all the focal group students for uh, minority, underserved, and students with disabilities. I don't think it's anybody that they, they're kind of excited that somebody went through and teased out all the data. And I said, did I reverse engineer your metric correct? And now their psychometricians are going back through it to see if I did it right. So again, so this will come back to the board in June. Um, all of these will be evaluated uh, over the next five years. But again, the primary one is which one does the board want to be the focal one for administration and staff to focus on for the next five years? And that's not that's not a question you're looking to have answered tonight. No, but this again, this is what the data looks like. These are the primary trends. We'll go to co-development. Um, the numbers may shift a bit when we look at how the top 10% is applied. They said, look at your top 10% as your comparator group. And then look at a fraction of that. I just took half of that growth rate and applied it to every single metric. And they said, that may be too much. It may be too little. And we're going to tell you kind of where it should be. Okay. So they're going to uh, kind of work with us over the next month. And then they said, bring it back to your boards in June with a more refined number. So we will have another discussion on this in June. Yes. And, okay. Correct. All right. Thank you very much. And I would encourage anybody, if you have any questions of Mr. Gaskoyak, give him a call, send him an email or something like that so he can clarify that. All right. Let's move on to 6.5 mathematics adoption. First reading, Mr. G. Okay. Um, yes. Local building and curriculum com committees have been meeting to review and select primary choices for a new mathematic curriculum at each school level. Building principals will be presenting the building's committee selections that are in public review prior to any formal action uh, to adoption at the curriculum meeting at in the June meeting. Um, and I see everybody up there in the top row, <laughs> but um, I do believe we have a consensus for a district-wide adoption across the board. Um, uh, again, the publisher's big idea is learning. Um, all Oregon math uh, across the board. Um, all of the text here uh, meet every Oregon standard for mathematics instruction from uh, grade through grade kindergarten all the way through the required Algebra II class. Anything beyond Algebra II is an independent course outside of that. So it's going to be either a separate book or it's a dual credit with Lane Community College. All right, so what I'm seeing here is that the mathematics curriculum, if this is accepted, is consistent through all 13 levels. Correct. All right, and this is our first reading, folks. Once again, if you want some more information on it, you're welcome to engage Mr. Koskoyak and... All right, let's... So, uh, moving on to the student calendar. 
So we have a slight revision coming up um, uh, from the high school ASB leadership group. Um, and the high school ASB leader, associated student body uh, vice president, Jane Lacatur in the 2023 okay. leadership class. Yes, she sent me an email earlier in the week and said that they would like to restructure freshman orientation. And so in anticipation of getting that email, I think uh, Mr. H sent me an email, said you might be getting an email from Jane. And I said, I will modify a student calendar in anticipation of that. And they would like to bring all students to campus on the first Tuesday after Labor Day. And they will do a uh, short assembly for freshmen in the afternoon. So you'll see uh, September 5th changed. It'll be a school orientation day for new elementary and sixth graders. The fifth will be the first day at the high grader at the high school for grades nine through twelve. And then they'll do an orientation presentation for ninth graders in the afternoon. Uh, and then kindergarten will still have their orientation week and meeting with parents uh, the fifth through the eighth with kindergarten starting on uh, the eleventh. So the, so the only thing we're changing is that we're bringing 10th, 11th, and 12th graders back to school on the 5th. How would that impact instructional hours? I know it would be positive, but... It, it brings uh, five hours into 10, 11, and 12. Is that an impact to... I mean, we're not just bringing the other students back early. We're, we're now losing orientation day. I mean, for no, them to be alone on campus. They're getting an assembly. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, they're doing an assembly and right. an activity in the afternoon. Yes. Okay. But they're not alone on campus to experience and have. No, again, yeah, we also do in eighth grade. We bring them over as eighth graders okay. in the afternoon okay. and we have an evening with parents in the spring. Okay. Um, yeah. You guys are good with that. They are. Uh, the administration brought it to me. It okay. came from the kids. They figure it's a better way to do it. Perfect. They'd rather have, instead of having the kid, the freshman kind of lost by themselves and then sure. swamped by everybody the next day. Yeah. They'd rather do kind of a collective group effort okay. and then have a special thing for the freshmen in the afternoon. Administration's behind it. I like it. Administration's behind it. Yeah. So that doesn't require any action from us. Is what I'm Officially it does because we are changing the district calendar. Yes. All right. So... At this time, uh, I would entertain a motion to change the district calendar as outlined by Mr. Guskoyak. Board Chair, be it resolved that the Syosset School District Board of Directors approve the revised 2023-24 student calendar as presented. Resolution number 051023-6.6, revised student calendar. Second that motion. Right, motion has been made by Director Barnett and seconded by Director Armandaris. To revise the calendar as described by Mr. Gruskoyak, is there any discussion? Yeah, quickly, my daughter proposed this apparently via email. I'm still allowed to vote, right? Absolutely. All right, fantastic. There's no conflict of interest, and I will say it was the best student email I've received all year. See, there, there is conflict of interest. Jane can do no wrong in my eyes, and now it's on the public record. Okay. <laughs> All right, the motion has been made and seconded uh, with no further discussion. One more thing. Self-serving or not. Yeah. Superintendent, thank you for that compliment. I will pass it on to her. Right. Yes, and thank, thank her for bringing that to us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all those in favor of the resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Motion carries unanimous. Any nay votes, we're going to have to deal with Jane. <laughs> All right. Superintendent Communications. And her bodyguard. <laughs> That's Dannon. <laughs> okay. So before I get into uh, all of my report, uh, first thing, um, I know we had a little uh, student incident or actually parent incident at a bus stop last week at 43rd Street. Uh, a special note should go to Ms. DeSaro and Mrs. McNeil for stepping in and helping out students in the immediate right then and there. I know there's other people involved, um, but again, it was uh, kind of a clutch situation and uh, they really helped out. And then uh, this afternoon, I did get a uh, email from uh, our sources of strength, uh, 
matchstick group. They're our uh, leadership consulting team. And uh, Julie Steiding of Cyrus Elementary School has been selected as a 2023 Sources of Strength uh, Elementary Award winner for leadership in the building across the board. So now on to the regular business. Uh, first off, uh, employee report personnel uh, for May 10th, uh, certified educators, uh, Audrey Reynolds, 2023-24 uh, uh, Sciusaw Middle School Math Intervention. This is an internal transfer uh, from social emotional developmental classroom. Uh, new hire Jason Metting, 2023-24 Sciusaw Middle School Science Teacher. Um, uh, again, he's actually replacing Mr. Goning, who is coming up to the high school. Uh, Amanda Richards, 2023-24 uh, Sciusaw Elementary School fifth grade teacher. Uh, she's filling the fifth slot. That's following the enrollment bubble up. I see Mr. Jorgensen. Yeah, I know you got a full five. Yeah, you're good. We got them all. Uh, classified, um, Crystal Heckle, uh, Secretary for Finance at the high school, who is filling for Ms. Free, who is going to be replacing Ms. McClellan. You can see the dominoes stacking up around the table. Um, so internal transfer from uh, elementary school aid, uh, Julie Berry, uh, Sisal, Middle, uh, Sisal Middle School, uh, kindergarten educational aid, that's a typo. We don't have any kindergartners at the middle school. Um, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure that's Sisal just Elementary that School. Way. That's my, I think that's my typo. Um, yeah, and relocate, she's re relocating uh, to Florence from Texas. Uh, retirements, resignations, and other separations, uh, Esther Nelson. Uh, Sisa Elementary School aid, uh, reloc relocating for personal regions. Uh, Andrea Sujevskotes, our uh, middle school interve intervention math teacher, uh, personal reasons for health. Uh, Mark Hills taking another position with another employer. Uh, Lindsay Fox, end of the year. Uh, Megan Donahue, uh, uh, middle school special ed aid, uh, end of the year. Brittany Anderson, middle school counselor, uh, personal reasons unrelated to employment. And uh, Mr. Ron Carruthers actually will be retiring as our transportation mechanic in September. Hmm. All right. We've already heard the pages referring to the longitudinal. Yes, longitudinal growth. I'm skipping through. Um, Again, uh, I got a letter of clarification on state assessment. We've been working on bringing up our uh, state assessment participation numbers the last few years. We've been hovering about 94, 95 percent. Uh, we're trying to get that number over 95 percent to actually make uh, state uh, state testing a little bit more of a valid uh, measure. Um, uh, again, parents have the right to opt out. Um, some local boards have been looking at a, an opt-in requirement. Um, and that is not consistent with state law. Um, I was just asked by um, the head of the state ed department to review that. We've not had that really been a, been a local issue, but I've presented it. Um, so again, it, we have the local opt-out stuff on the website. We have a few people that need to do it for whatever reason, and really not an issue. Um, and then... Uh, a few items of note for events coming up uh, down uh, the road. Uh, May 17th, uh, SES Time Capsule Project, 1 p.m. If you can schedule this, uh, Ms. Wachtel's second grade class will be unearthing a time capsule that was buried 32 years ago by elementary students. And then they will be placing their own time capsule back for a future class to discover. That one's had a two-year COVID delay, but it'll be coming up May 17th at 1 o'clock. And then, of course, May 22nd, Evening of Excellence, May 24th, Scholarship Night. Both of those events will be at the Florence Event Center and June 9th, uh, high school graduation. And then uh, your April Vikings of the Month, as reported uh, previously on KCST Radio, are listed below for the high school, uh, middle school, and elementary school. All right. And I'm trying to move as fast as I can and keep everybody up to pace because I know Odark oh, 30 is coming for us all. <laughs> One way or another. 
All right. Any questions at this time? Yeah. All right. We also have Ms. Howell's communications. Thank you very much. Uh, and the other administrative reports, Ms. Utz, Mr. Marol, Mrs. Flora, and Mr. Harkle Road. Thank you very much for those. All right. And Baird Board Chair Communications. The last thing Mr. Goskoyak mentioned was graduation. So we need two folks to hand out diplomas on graduation night. Unfortunately, I am not available. John Barnett. I'd like to volunteer. And how about Director Lacatour? Big point to me. You've been nominated. You two were. I'll admit, I was not necessarily looking forward to that, but it was awesome. Okay. So, if y'all, yeah, if y'all are pointing to me, I'll I'll take that. You want the job? I'll I'll, I'll take the okay. job. Yeah. How many times have you been able to do that, John? What's that? How many times have you handed out diplomas? I've done it a few times. It seems like I always just like this year, I've done a whole bunch of my daughter's friends are graduating okay. and stuff. And okay. so that was just, I've just got a personal reasons this year. If I can, that'd be great. Okay. So. Uh, let me also say if there is somebody else that would like to do that with John, then of course I would, I would step aside. You Not that great. You guys were a perfect team. Yeah. You were amazing. Yeah, you got everyone, every diploma to the right kid. That was you got a hundred percent rate. <laughs> and I would like to point out that uh, Coast Radio is going to be broadcasting the uh, the commencement exercises that night again, and it will be YouTube uh, streamed live. And Chuck Chuck Johnson will be doing the color commentary. Yeah. <laughs> he did that with you last year. Right? He did that with me last year. Yeah. So, uh, OSBA Summer Board Conference informational. It's coming up August 11th. Is the pre conference. It'll be in Salem uh, this year instead of in Bend. So, anybody who would like to go to that, you're encouraged to check in with Mrs. McClellan. Um, board self evaluation. We have scheduled uh, Vince Adams to be at our meeting on the 14th. He will be sending a questionnaire out to all directors. And it's a it's a private self-evaluation uh, that he will collect the information and collate it. And we'll have we'll talk about it at the meeting on the 14th. So please watch for that in your in your email inbox and respond. Uh, and we're beginning in the process for appointing student representatives for next year. And Riley Olson, are you interested in reapplying? Uh, are you interested in reapplying for next year? Okay. I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, I wanted to put you on the spot. All right. So uh, we need two board members to work on the screening process with, with staff. Anybody have any volunteers? Vice Chair Milton Berger? Pardon? Oh. And and Frank Armadars, anybody else? Okay, so we'll we'll do an arm wrestling. But can you work with three? Okay, all right, that's good. If we get the yeah, four's the magic number. That becomes a quorum, and we can't do that. All right, so meeting dates coming up. We've already established we have a meeting. When do we have the meeting? It's been a long night. <laughs> next Tuesday. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday at the district office. Yes. Um, 6 p.m. Exactly. Yeah, 6 exactly. p.m. Our regular board meeting for June is scheduled for the 14th at the district office. Uh, and we have, uh, during our agenda planning last week, a work session we put on the calendar for July 26th. And so whomever is on the board at that time, please mark your calendars for that. That's a really important date in, in my estimation, because that is when we want to work on just developing our rules of engagement 
how do we want to how do we want to do business and how how do we want to deal with each other? So please mark that uh, we we have tentatively planned from noon until five that day, and then twenty uh, sixth will be the first uh, meeting of the the new year uh, that will administer oaths of office and do the organizational requirements like we have to we have to take action every year at the beginning of the fiscal year and point to you know our fiscal agents and insurance and all that sort of stuff so we have to, we'll go through that so uh i would really hope we'd encourage everybody to make that date available uh august 11th through the 13th the summer conference and then a regular board meeting in august would be off of our regular schedule that would be on the 23rd that's a we've checked with staff that's that's a, a good week that he says to do it um, because it's a good timing before kids and everybody get back in. And then, of course, the, the regular September board meeting would be on the second Wednesday in September. The way the calendar falls this year, we don't have to bump it to the third like we have traditionally done. So, Can, can I just ask? Yeah. The survey results that are starting to come in, are we, are they, are we gathering those? When are we going to start seeing some of those? Uh, you'll have, you'll have them next month. I'm just okay. sorting them out and just collating them. That's it. Okay. Um, the one set that was with the ESD, they had to unlock them and send them because I had them. I didn't collect them. I had them collected by the ESD. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. All right. So we'll go around the room and Director Lacketeer, you I, have any? I have a question oh. first. Oh. Um, so the charter school is going to be on the next month's agenda, and we don't have a time frame on the September. To September 14th is what we'd anticipate doing that. On the charter? Charter school. school. So June 14th. June 14th. Yeah. And that we don't well, have a time September. requirement or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's my brother's wedding anniversary. No, I, I thought that they had more that they need to offer in terms of application. They do. And so what I've what I've sent the board, I queued it up during the break, is um the ORS 338, which is the legal um, requirements for um, submission of an application. And then uh, you also have um, my list of primary questions, which were to their main application that was submitted to the district office. Because um, again, there was items that are inferred from enrollment that aren't specifically delineated, but that are required. Um, and then um, the Division 22 standards for public education, um, they're required to meet all of those because they are a public school. Um, and then uh, the other part that I'll send uh, Eric later is that um, the uh, required uh, curriculum standards, because uh, again, they list texts that aren't on the approved vetted list. One of the three is, the other two, Need supplementation. So the brief answer to your question is June 14th. All right. Now let's go around the room. Director Lacatour, do you have any acknowledgments or anything you would like to shout out besides your daughter? Oh no, I you didn't do that. that legitimately, I was just gonna brag on my daughters again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Director Pim Lott, do you have anything you would like to, for the good of the order? No, just, I, you know, I think everybody's kind of stated, but golf, wow. Yeah, that's fantastic. Chuck Johnson, by the way, the coach. Really amazing. Yeah. yeah. Director Snedden. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Thank you for reminding us again. Thank you. Director Armandars. Yeah, I was had an opportunity to spend an evening with um, Sonia McKenzie from the Oregon School Board Association and and uh, Congresswoman Bonamici uh, from up in the Portland area last week, and and we talked to a lot of people online for several hours one day. Um, and uh, one of the questions I was asked was, uh, well, how do we get more people involved in uh, the activities of the school board? And one of the one of the recommendations I made was to first thing to show up at a school board meeting. Mm -hmm. So I guess they got the message this evening. So I was very gratified to see the crowd. All right. 
Mr. Olson, do you have anything? Um, well, Katie stole it from me, but happy te Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, they work really hard, they don't get paid a lot, and they don't get the recognition they deserve. Uh, I suppose I don't really have anything on top of that. Are I'll you fishing for a grade? No, oh. <laughs> but I'm, I'm taking one if you're offering. I'll take it if you're offering. <laughs> That's all I got. Though. All right, thank you, Riley. Mr. Director Barnett. Uh, yeah, I just want to throw out, you know, it's I always love seeing the the color run and that's just uh, it's been been a pretty, pretty fun annual thing that's um, nice to see back again and the PTA talent show was pretty, pretty darn neat as well that's always fun I remember, even my oldest son who's now 28 when he did it, I still got an old hazy video clip of him doing a disney musical thing that he was doing you on so, videos we could do that sometime. oh yeah we in any yeah. case around christmas time that always comes back around to thoroughly embarrass him so um just briefly golf and track this year our our fall sports are or or excuse me our spring sports are fantastic so let's fall in argentina yeah there you go so um middle school stream team um it's always neat i remember going out and pulling the scotch broom out and stuff with the with the stream team and stuff and that's always just just gratifying and a lot of fun and you know good education process for the kids too so that's uh that's all i got all right thank you vice chair miltenberger i also saw the pta talent show it was incredible we have a pianist that's what's fifth grade or something like that that's playing on a level that could be concert level and singers and and dancers and it was incredible i mean once again we have so many talented people in our community it's kids in our community it's amazing everybody should see this it's just great stuff i particularly liked the comic the last act i had just one yes, shout out i i meant to science fair science arts it was really impressive very very impressive lots of um lots of great ideas and what was our winner i think we were taking a toll yeah, yeah. all right the smile yeah okay all right thank you Oh, uh, everybody mentioned the things that I wanted to mention, and I just, it, it's its that time of year, the school year is winding down, and its I think it's tough to keep the students' attentions, uh, but it, <laughs> you know, I may have a say in who gets the appointment next year. <laughs> uh, but but it's obvious to me that you you're keeping kids engaged and uh, appreciated and happy teachers week. Uh, anything else before this body? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion made to, to adjourn by Director Barnett, second by Director Armendaris at 9.23 p.m. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Suppose, say nay. We are adjourned. Thank you all for being here tonight.